was alien. Black magic will surround you. What's the password? Skullduggery. I claim the soul of your unborn child, and I cast the spell on him and his offspring. This low budget crap wouldn't buy a bag of bird shit. The strangest thing happened to me today. We were in the operating room. I reached for the scalpel, and suddenly it was a dagger, like the one we use in the game. I've got a raccoon in my pants. Would you like to set it free? A high-level sorcerer wants to hire you to kill her. A sorceress dressed in white. Like a bride. Or a nurse. That is a fig leaf. Oh, can we smoke it? Hard to say where the game begins or life ends. Sometimes I feel like one of those figurines on the board. Could you please deflate your tits? You gonna butcher some chicken this session too? Skullduggery. Count this as my failure, Lord. Sheriff, Mrs. Fitch here. Those Benson monsters are planning something. I will protect my bush. But the people have turned away from you. If you knew the ways of the world, Mr. Morgan, you'd know that a man's word can be bought just like a coat or a piece of meat. That they have thrown aside your commandments. Yes, I earned it. To get what I never had, I married an old man whose skin even smells musty. I worked and schemed to get this. But mark the people of this town as no different from those of any other. You murdered Harvey! It was an accident! You saw it! It was only an accident! Ruby? Ruby, what is it? At the window, a figure. I don't know what it was. Vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. This is Hans Manship from A Day of Judgment and House of Death, back again on the Hysteria Continues. Yes, welcome back to the Hysteria Continues, um, episode 47. And um, let me turn down that that jolly music from, um, I think it's uh, one of our feature presentations, which is... Day of Judgment. Day yeah. of Judgment, mm-hmm. yes, and Skullduggery we're following today, or covering today indeed. Um so, welcome to my fellow Stormbringers. Um, how are we doing um, over in Ireland today, Eric? Well, I'm a bit worried, actually, Justin. Why is that? I'm really worried. Because I, I have to go for blood tests tomorrow, and I have to fast from 7 or 8 o'clock tonight, which means I have to go about 13 hours without eating. <laughs> I don't know what I'm going to do. <sighs> I don't, I don't You're not being very supportive. Well, I'm trying to think of something supportive to say. Well, could you not have a load of chunky Kit Kats before you start well, the fast? Well, that's my plan. I have, mm. I've got a four-pack of twirls. I'm going to stuff myself with as soon as we're finished here, mm. and then I'm going to take a sleeping tablet at about half seven. Gosh, that sounds very <laughs> yeah. decadent. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. Well, you, so you that's don't my. Need a, that's... You don't need a sleeping tablet, um, Eric. Surely you could just watch uh, Day of Judgment again. Uh, well, we'll find out about that later, yes. Yes, okay. And I think it sounds as if we've lost somebody already. Have we lost somebody? <laughs> we've lost, we've lost Not Joseph. Me. No, we've lost Joseph. We've lost Joseph. We're going to have one of those shows. I think we're cursed. Oops. Okay, and by the magic of internet radio, we are back. So, Eric, um, you're still on your fast. Well, you haven't started your fast yet, have you? No, I don't have to start till tonight. But okay. if we keep having internet dropouts and we are still recording at 11 o'clock, <laughs> then I will be fit to eat anything yes well we, we hope um we are now fixed aren't we joseph are we fixed you're fixed i certainly hope so what did i miss while i was away um talk of chunky kit kats and that was about see it, i had a i had a really nice lead in uh, like a quote i was going to use until we got disconnected so well that's why don't all. you why don't you give us a quote anyway and just um so i'd say how are you joseph Oh, I was just going to s- recite the lyrics to a, a well-known rap song called Informer by Snow. Oh, I it remember says that something, one. He says something about licking your boom-boom down. I see. Never heard of it. <laughs> <laughs> I know anyway. it. Do you? You, yeah. you would, Eric. Why do you I know I lick your boom-boom down. I think yeah. that's it. Informer. But it did Yeah, he speaks really fast. Yes, he does. It was a big hit in the early 90s. Was it? Yes. I see. It's Eric. You've got. You've got. I reckon you should do some, go on X Factor or something because you've got. You've got real lust for song, haven't you? I you, do. You like singing. I have a love for music. You do. Yes. Well, maybe. Well, maybe you. I'm um, actually. I already. I'm looking forward to hearing the theme music to Skull Degree at the end of the podcast. Are you going to sing along this time? 
Uh, we see when I sing along, it's not in sync because uh, what I hear is a few seconds after what is actually being played, if you understand me. Because I, I was listening to Mr. Sandman and I was all out of time. I know, but um, mm. we, we've had we've had comments on that um, on your song. Oh, have we? Yes, Eric. Yeah. Um, maybe we'll come on to those a little bit later. But Nathan, yeah. how are you doing? I'm good. Yes, good. Because you've had um, you your times changed, isn't it? In in tennis, when in the states, you've gone back an hour, forward an hour. Yeah, it's nine thirty a.m. right now. Oh, so you've got an extra. You had an extra hour in bed as, um, <laughs> for this one. <laughs> Or was it? That was the last weekend. Last actually. weekend. Yeah. Right. Okay. Okay. All right. Well, good stuff. Um, um, how am I? I've just been, I've just had a bit of a cold flu thing, so I might be coughing and spluttering. But um, last night we went to a indoor firework display. Did you used to have Ooh. those, Eric? Indoor fireworks? Yes. No. No. How about in the States? No. Did you have indoor fireworks? No, I don't think so. No. Well, they, well, they're kind of. Um, we had them in the seventies when I was growing up, um, and so we had them. And basically, what they are, they are as they sound, indoor fireworks, except um, they are really, really pathetic fireworks because what they are, are kind of little kind of blobs. They look like Alka Seltzers, and you put a, light, a, um, a match to them, and then they they glow or they kind of go on fire about an inch flame, and a couple of little sparks come out, and then they go out. And then and they you went to this. <laughs> <laughs> what did we go to? We had our friend was having a little party, so we went round, and it's slightly. Are you ironic. still your friends now? Yeah. Well, no. The, well, they held the party. Yeah. It was slightly ironic, and there's one called. Um, they've all got names like Wizard Sleeve and things like that. Like really, kind of, <laughs> sort of, um, kind of. <laughs> a Wizard that, Sleeve is a rude thing. I know. I know. It wasn't actually Wizard Sleeve, but it was all kind of things like um, Towering Worm and things like that. And they have these this kind of Towering Worm or Racing Worms, and they kind of. You light it, and it comes out like this poo, this kind of unfurling poo. It looks like the um, the pavement or, or whatever it's on the table is doing a poo, and it comes out in this big kind of foam sausage. Ew. So, <laughs> so anyway, foam sausage. I've heard it all. <laughs> so anyway, so that's the excitement um, of my life at the moment. But things can only get better with our feature presentations, can't they, Eric? <laughs> speaking of... No, let's talk of, about the poo for a while. Yeah, I want to talk about the poo for a second because I found myself at work during the week talking to my boss about that scene in Pink Flamingos with Divine and the dog poo. Yes. And as I was saying it, I kept saying to myself, Eric, stop, stop now. You're talking to your boss. You Don't forget, you're talking to your boss and you're telling him about the climactic scene of Pink Flamingos. Yes. He thought it was hilarious, but I was like thinking to myself, "Oh God, there's my chances of a promotion of a promotion gone forever." Had you just been eating a chunky Kit Kat and you had brown teeth? <laughs> Ew! <laughs> I can't remember how we got onto the topic. Mm. He was asking me who John Waters was. That's who it was. Right. Okay. That's what it was. Okay. Well, you kept uh, your job so. anyway, so that's that's good. Yeah, I'm still employed for yes. how long? I don't know. <laughs> yes, yeah, so he's probably sent a memo. Um, yeah. <laughs> so we are covering today. Um, two of jo- um, sorry, Eric's picks, aren't we? Don't yes. blame me. Yeah, they're yes, not so Joseph's picks. Yeah, no, I, I do apologise, Joseph. <laughs> yes, um, a day you of might, judgment. They're, they're very Nathan esque. Let me just they say are, that. They are. Yeah. They are. Um, a day of judgment so and skullduggery, of which we will come on to a little bit later. But we are also going to be doing um, looking at another top three, which this time is going to be top three general horror films we'd like to see remade. Um, but before we do that shall we get on to recently seen because we've just gone through halloween and obviously we covered halloween one and two on the last show and we got quite a lot of feedback on that a little bit later but um uh guys what were you watching over halloween how about you nathan well i watched um i went to the theater and watched halloween which mm. was a great experience was I it good it. it was good was I, it? yeah well i mean as in as in did you how did you find it with a modern audience um, well, I've found it with like six other people in the theater. Right. Okay. So, Ooh. you know, but, um, it was a t- like a Tuesday night, so I didn't expect there would be like a, a sellout or anything. And yeah. actually the audience was very respectful. They didn't, um, you know, they didn't laugh at the parts that weren't funny, mm. which uh, I was worried about. Um, and the popcorn was really good. Okay. Um, well, that's good. And uh, the Dr Pepper was excellent as well. <laughs> I mean, how did it? How did it work? I mean, did it kind of? Um, did it give you anything extra on the big screen? 
for a film you've probably seen like a, g- a gazillion uh, times God, before. I've seen that movie. I, I was like, quoting it like in my head before the dialogue would even happen. I mean, mm. I don't think there's anything extra that I could have seen. I mean, mm. um, I didn't see anything, you know, um, extra, but, you know, I loved every minute of it. Mm. It was great. I mean, like hearing it like in the theater with surround sound and everything, it was was a great experience. Mm-hmm. Yeah, well, did any of uh, you other guys see it as well? I did. Uh, Grant Grant went with me. Okay. I had to miss it this year. I was busy working on the house. Okay, well, no, fair enough, fair enough. Um, yeah, but- I went to see it in Dublin, and uh, but I don't think it was this new fancy 35mm remastered print that's doing the rounds. It very, looked very much like it was projected off either DVD or Blu-ray, uh, which wasn't a problem. The problem for me was the sound was quite... Um, it was very at sort of mid-level. It almost felt like you were sitting in the comfort of your own living room. Right. Um, so I would have liked the soundtrack to be slightly louder. But having said that, I did really enjoy it. Uh, I didn't notice anything extra in the film that I hadn't noticed before, but it was nice to see certain of the shock scenes uh, getting a gasp from the audience because I'm, I'm guessing by the reaction that a lot of them, the people there had never seen it before. Mm. Um, you know, so... Uh, there was a lot of giggles as well at uh, certain points, as, as Nathan was saying, uh, when Annie dies, you know, her sort of uh, <laughs> boss, her boss eyed collapse onto the steering wheel of the car got yes. a, a lot of laughs. Mm. OK, well, no, that, that's um, it's, it's a shame, actually, because the, the soundtrack is one of the, the pivotal things, isn't it, of Halloween? Yeah, so I know. So none, none of the sting effects really had any shock value. Mm-hmm. Um, but I mean, the, the, the eerie scenes like where Annie is on the phone talking to Paul and you can see the shape suddenly appear in the, on the porch in the background, that type of stuff was really effective. Mm-hmm. I thought. Excellent. OK. Well, thank you, um, Eric. How about Nathan? Anything else you've been watching? Um, I watched The Grave Encounters Part 2. Okay. Is it any better um, than the first one? They made one? a Part 2. Yeah. Um, the thing is, like, uh, my problem with Grave Encounters Part 1 is I thought it was great until the big climactic scenes, and I thought it kind of went over the top and got a little too silly. Mm. It didn't, like, I, it wasn't exactly scary at the end. It was, you know, I don't know. I mean, I, I liked the first half, but not the second. Mm. And this movie is, it's it's very weird the way they set the sequel up, because it's like they're treating the first movie as, you know, like, you know, this, like, young um documentary filmmaker has seen the first grave encounters and finds out that there's some weirdness behind it because people are secretive about it and the actors have never done anything else. So he starts investigating it. And I wonder why it starts. To, <laughs> so he starts to find out that I guess the, um, the first one really did happen after all. Hmm. Cause it's, you know, the first, they're found footage movies. And then of course they end up going to the same, um, you know, abandoned uh, hospital and, you know, they uh, get trapped in there and more crazy stuff happens. And it really, I mean, part one's probably better, but is that saying a whole lot? Mm. I mean, both of them are just mad for me. I'd probably give them both a five out of ten. It's a shame. See, I like the first it's... half of the Grave Encounters, the first one. Mm. I thought the buildup was excellent. And then it yeah. had all those CGI hands coming out of the ceiling. I thought it looked really silly. This one has more of that. FYI. Uh, then- I'll skip it. Mm, mm. Have you seen At the Pleasure, Eric? No, I've never seen either entry. Oh, well. <laughs> uh, um, <laughs> you can't say anything these days. You can't. Oh. And also, we haven't had a. Um... Nixon, please, I'm not that kind of doctor. So, yes. Well, I haven't seen, I have seen Grave Encounters, but I was quite disappointed with it after the, the trailer. And it just kind of, exactly what you said, Nathan, it, so it was a good build up. And then it just goes completely over the top and becomes just, um, you know, hammers you over the head with special effects and not too good special effects at that. And so it loses all sense of creepiness. Um, if you want to see a decent asylum, um, you know, abandoned asylum movie, watch Session 9 would be my advice. But, um, excellent. Anything else? No, that's it. No, okay. Well, thank you, Nathan. How about you, Joseph? Oops, we just had a little break there because um, Joseph had a pussy kerfuffle, didn't you, Joseph? Yeah, I have a bad pussy. Yes. So, what have you been watching, Joseph? Well, I watched a movie called... The Barons, um, was directed by Darren Lynn Bousman, who did the Saw 2 and Mother's Day. And it has that guy from uh, True Blood, uh, Stephen Moyer. He plays Bill. And it was an okay movie. Um, 
basically about this family who go camping in the the Pine Barrens, and there's like legends of a the the Jersey Devil around there killing people, and hmm. basically the Stephen Moyer character, without getting too spoilery, he kind of starts going a little off the deep end so you don't know if he's crazy or if there really is a demon out there and that's pretty much the build up of the whole movie and I won't tell you whether which is true but uh yeah it was okay I mean it had some good suspense and the acting and then the special effects were what excuse me were what really got me I mean I was kind of impressed that they used very little CGI and went a lot you know very practical on a lot of the effects mm. so yeah, I would give that a definite recommendation if you happen to run across a copy somewhere. Would you say it was better than the other Pine Barrens movie, The Last Broadcast? Uh, yeah, I would, because the last broadcast, I thought, you know, had a good build-up and then had a, a really shitty ending, whereas this film, I rather liked how it ended. Oh, I quite like the ending to The Last Broadcast. You do? Hmm. Hmm, I don't know. I thought it kind of took me out of the movie. Okay, all right. Well, that sounds interesting. Is there anything else? Uh, no. I mean, I've I've got like several movies on my in my queue that I need to watch, but I just I haven't. Got, I've been you know kind of busy working on the house since we moved in. So, of course, it's not like a kind of a sinister style moving into a house or an insidious, is it? Yeah, well, man. it is insidious because, uh, like your cat Argento, my cat Philby keeps shitting on the floor, and I'm having to clean up after it. Mm. So it's an it's an insidious stench. Okay. <laughs> Have you got? I tell you what. I mean, this isn't really much of interest to anyone listening to the podcast, but um, you can get. I don't know if you can get them in the states, but we get them here called Felly Way, which are little plugins for cats. Not not to plug in the cat, but to plug in the wall, <laughs> and it gives off a pheromone um, that makes them feel all reassured and stops them. Pooing, well, not stops them hmm. pooing, but stops them pooing on the floor. I've never heard of that, but I'll have to look into it. Yeah, well, it's worth having a look. Have a look on eBay, but it kind of it gives the same pheromone as for happy cats, and it's supposed to stop them <laughs> shitting on the floor. Although it doesn't work for our cats, but it might work for yours. Why do you, do you only go to the toilet if you're feeling unhappy? <laughs> well, no, but See, I'm I talking installed, about outside. I installed a dog door going into the garage where their litter pan is, and they use it. But at the same time, they, you know, nice hardwood floors. So they want to, you know, do it on there too. Wow. Well, it's only because we've got four cats at the moment, so it's kind of theirs and three litter trays, and it's kind of. We have a three: bit. a dog, seven fish, and a rabbit. Wow, that is quite. Yeah, a, that's it's quite like a, a zoo. It's like a zoo in here. A yes. skullduggery type rabbit. <laughs> yeah, it's a little brown rabbit. Okay. It likes well, to leave little pellets in places that I'd rather it not leave them. Gosh. Right. Well, thank you for that, Joseph. Um, <laughs> um, <laughs> we'll, we'll move on from um, cat toilets. Hopefully, um, Argento won't disgrace himself this time, but uh, and yours won't do and disgrace him or herself while we're recording. Or well, it sounds like they already have by pulling pulling you off. Yes. Um, <laughs> Philby, so Philby's now clawing at the fireplace. I don't know why. Because Philby doesn't have any claws, so he likes to feel a brick under his fingers. Is that... Um, so maybe there's some kind of weird spirit or something in the fireplace. Could yeah. be. It's a, mm. it's a gas fireplace, so uh, I don't know. Mm, okay. There's a woman bricked up behind the wall. That's what it is. Yes. <laughs> yeah, that's what it is. <laughs> right. Okay, well, thank you, Joseph. Um, Eric, what have you been watching apart from okay, well, Watch Skullduggery and A Day of Judgment? Yes, well, when we recorded last, I was about to venture into town for the horathon, so I, I saw... Or horror thong. Yes, horror thong. Uh, let's not talk about the horror thong. Um, I went to see eight movies then in the cinema. I saw five on the Monday alone, which meant I was in the cinema for 11 hours without a break. And all I had to eat that day actually was a bag of crisps. So I think I did quite well. I think I'm feeling much more confident about my fast tonight. Um, I'll just quickly run through what I saw because there was a good few of them. The first of all, the surprise film turned out to be Chained, which is the latest uh, Jennifer Lynch movie mm. starring Vincent D'Onofrio. And he plays a serial killer who abducts a mother and son he murders a mother and then keeps the son chained up in his remote country house, shack house thing. Uh, and then years go by and he's, you know, the boy grows to adulthood and the captor then tries to rear him as a serial killer, teaches him the ways of how to be a serial killer. Uh, it was quite good. It's very, it's, it's grim in places and it's very much uh, one watch only. But I mean, 
when Jennifer Lynch's name came up in the credits, everyone groaned. They were like, oh, expecting something really, really horrible. Was she but it there? actually wasn't. It wasn't half bad. She mm? wasn't in. It wasn't in in attendance, was she? No, she oh, wasn't sorry. in attendance. Okay. No. Thankfully. Yes. <laughs> uh, the next film I saw turned out to be the festival favourite for a lot of people. I was a bit iffy about it, to be honest. It was called Incision. And it's, it's getting a lot of praise in certain quarters. My, my problem with it mainly is that I don't see it as a horror film at all. I saw it more as a quirky indie comedy. It's about a young high school misfit who's really sarcastic and she dresses down and she's got you know, lots of spots on her face. And she's obsessed with blood and, and yearns to be a surgeon. Um, so that leads to some mild elements of gore. Um, but I mean, it's closer in tone to something like Donnie Darko with maybe a dash of Napoleon Dynamite. Um, you know, I found it a bit smug. It's kind of like, it's, it's almost like it's, it's trying too hard to be kind of a cult movie, hmm. uh, is how I felt. Now, having said that, there's brilliant performance by the lead actress, who's Anna Lynn McCord, who I believe is best known for being in 90210, the sort of newer version. Uh, Tracy Lords is in it playing her mother, and she's absolutely brilliant. I mean, I didn't realise it was her until I checked the IMDb lists afterwards. Uh, and John Waters is in there, Justin, you'll be glad to hear, with a okay. cameo role as a, as a priest, hmm. believe it or not. And no, I, th- I mean, I did really enjoy the film, but I would not classify it as a horror film myself. I wouldn't I either. Have you seen it? Yeah? Yes, I've seen it. What did you think? Um, I liked it, but I have to admit, about around the hour mark, I was kind of like just starting to feel a little bored. I was kind of like, okay, where's this movie going? I mean, it seemed like a bunch of randomness mm. going on. I mean, I don't know. And I admit, though, I think the ending is quite jarring. It was, I suppose. Yeah, I suppose the, the yeah. ending just justifies maybe the horror tag, possibly. Mm. Uh, then later on that evening, uh, for me, the highlight of the, of the festival was a big screen outing for Halloween 3, Season of the Witch, which worked really good with an audience. A lot of people were quite tipsy, so they're really in the mood for, I suppose, what is a, a, a sort of trashy, fun movie. And what made it all the better was that there's all the Irishisms that are contained within the Halloween 3 mm-hmm. uh, plot, like the Dublin Inn got a big round of applause when Rafferty, who is the owner of the Rose of Shannon Motel, opens his mouth and his you know, nasty um, uh, Hollywood Irish accent comes out. Everyone guffawed, was brilliant. And also the fact that um, at one stage, Dan O'Hurley, he says to Tom Atkins, enjoy the horror-thon. That got a great big round of applause. Um, and that, that for me was the highlight of the weekend because it looked absolutely brilliant on, on the big screen. And I mean, I assume they were projecting it off the recent Scream Factory Blu-ray. Mm. Um, but it looked really, really good. The sound, And they had the sound cranked up, which unlike my experience with the first Halloween a few days later, you know, really made it very effective. Um, The next day I went to see Nightmare Factory, which is a documentary about KNB effects, although it mainly focused on Greg Nicotero. Uh, It was quite entertaining. It's very much a DVD extra, though, I feel, rather than a a sort of a standalone documentary. Uh, After that, Burning Moon, which I'd never heard of before, but it's a 1997 shot on VHS anthology movie. Uh, from Germany, directed by Olaf Ittenbach. And this is my first introduction to his filmmaking style. Mm. Um, The framing story has a deadbeat junkie looking after his little sister and he tells her two sort of horror stories. The first one of which is very much a slasher movie uh, about a woman who realises the new man in her life is a serial killer. Uh, The second one features a village simpleton who's been framed by the local priest for the rape and murder of several women in the area and a vigilante group formed to murder him but then sort of things take a supernatural and very, very gory turn. Um, now, I, I have to say, I did re- really enjoy this film. It was so cheesy. It was like a 90s version of Bloody Moon or Pieces. Uh, and it features my favourite line of dialogue t- uh, that I've heard in a long time, which was, I want you to absorb my love juice, which I thought was fantastic. Um, then we had Sleep Tight, which is a Spanish movie. Mm. Um which reminded me very much of The Resident. Do you remember The Resident? It was, I think it was Hammer's first movie in their recent um, yes. resurrection. I've, I've seen, I've seen um, the trailer for that. It looked quite interesting. Yeah, it's the, uh, uh, this porter in an apartment block breaks into the apartment of a woman that he really fancies on a nightly basis, on a nightly basis and he uh, chloroforms her so that he can basically climb into bed with, with her without fear of her waking up and then sort of he leaves again before she regains consciousness. Mm. Um, and the thing about it is the lead character is actually, even though he's doing something really evil, he's actually quite likeable and you get a lot of tension out of 
uh, you know, hoping he doesn't get caught by various people. And there's also a great subplot involving this 12 year old girl who lives in the a complex who knows what he's up to and she keeps blackmailing him. Mm. Um, I mean, it's it's darkly comic in places and there's lots of tension and suspense uh, with some really interesting characters. I really, really enjoyed it, I have to say, even though that plot wise, as I said, it's remarkably similar to The Resident, which came out about four or five years ago, I reckon now, is it? Mm. Um, it was awful, wasn't it? The Hammer film, Hilary Swank. I thought it was okay. Well, it's not awful, but it was very mm. generic, wasn't it? It was very generic, yeah, but mm. I mean, I thought it was okay. Speaking of very generic, the film after that was Halloween 4, which was, had an introduction by Danielle Harris, who was the guest this year. Mm. Uh, and she, like, she's really funny, and um, she seems comes across as a really lovely person, but I just think Halloween 4 is deathly dull. I mean, I, and my opinion didn't change after watching it on the big screen again. Um, although it was funny when she first appears on screen, everyone went ah, oh, and you could hear her, you could hear her at the back of the cinema going ah, oh, shut up, which is quite fun. Yeah. yeah. Um, then the evening concluded, and the horathon concluded with Nightbreed, the Cabal Cut, mm. which really got quite a negative response from what I read on on um, message boards afterwards. I really enjoyed it. Now the VHS quality is jarring to say the least. It was far worse than I was expecting, uh, and the bulk of the movie is. VHS quality and it's kind of bizarre to see what looked like a bootleg VHS projected onto a big cinema screen mm. but I mean I really got into the film I really enjoyed it and the guy who's compiling the, this cut Russell Charrington was there and he explained that Morgan Creek the company who released it do have the original negatives and all that stored away but they're just unwilling to to um, cooperate at the moment anyway so he, what he's doing is he's putting out he's going around festivals touring with this cabal cut with the hopes of raising enough money to eventually get Morgan Creek to hand over the proper elements so we can release okay. a proper Blu-ray mm-hmm. version of this cut. Now it runs about two hours, 20 minutes. Uh, I really enjoyed it. I mean, it's still very flawed, but um, uh, it makes far more sense than the theatrical cut from what I can remember because mm-hmm. it's been about 20 years since I saw that. But I mean, a lot of people in the audience just didn't like it, didn't care for it, both the film content and the presentation were bothering a lot of people. So... Okay. Okay. Well, interesting. Right. Well, thank you, Eric. Is that is that your your lot? That's my lot. Yeah. Sorry, it was a bit long winded. But no, I, no, no. It's good. It was yeah. interesting to hear it because um, um, some of those films, um, you know, aren't out yet, and also it's good to sort of um, see some of those films like because um, I know Patrick from Scream Queen saw the same cut, and he was talking about it a little while ago. And um, and if you're listening to this, we didn't. Just an aside. Um, unfortunately, we didn't uh, get nominated. For podcaster award so thanks for voting everyone um but screen queens are up for an award so please do head over i think it's if you google podcaster awards um and uh nominate um screen queens you can do it once a day as well so it'd be really good yeah, they're the um, best friends. blt podcast isn't it B- or something? blt yes best yeah. blt uh, mm-hmm. uh bacon lettuce and tomato <laughs> Um, yes, but do vote for um, Screen Queens. It's a great podcast. So, And also, I know um, we've got quite a few new listeners who've come over from uh, Screen Queens, including Betty. Um, and is it Lauren? I can't remember. Sorry, apologies if I can't remember because I've got in front of me. But um, uh, thanks for joining us. And um, yes, well, just quickly run through what I've been watching. On, um, on Halloween, I was up in London, which is why I missed the big screen. Um, version of Halloween because only showing on Halloween night here and I saw Dina Martino who's a kind of very twisted drag queen with the hairy back in Soho um, but on the a few nights after we had a double bill um, and I had some friends over and one of them is deathly scared of horror movies and so the the only thing that we could get her to watch was Pee Wee's Big Adventure um, <laughs> <laughs> And uh, even with the, the, the big Marge or large Marge scene, do you remember the large Marge scene? Be Where... sure to tell him, large Marge sent yes. you. <laughs> um, even that got a scream out of her. So wow. being having a few drinks inside all of us, I then popped on the, um, the innkeepers after that and told her it wasn't very scary at all. And of course it starts off not very scary. And then when Maureen O'Malley or whatever sits up in the bed with a, um, with a sheet on the head, and um, it pulls back, and then her f- screaming face there. Then they they left, but um, <laughs> so otherwise <laughs> the evening was a great success. But um, yeah. the other film I watched, um, and this is going probably just just after we recorded last time, um, it came through on Love Film was a film called Mask Maker, 
which is um, uh, kind of a slash movie, which is very much a throwback to slash movies and specifically Texas Chainsaw Massacre. And um, it's, but it's got lots of, lots of bits lifted from other classic um, slash movies. Um, it's no great shakes, actually. I didn't think it was particularly good at all, but it's kind of the story of uh, uh, college sweethearts who buy a rundown house, which happens to have an undead killer um, buried in the back garden who somehow comes back to life, but it's not really said how. And what the killer does, every time he kills somebody, he rips their face off and wears their face a la um, leather face. And... Um, it's just it's it's very derivative it's got some good gore effects in it um but it's kind of it's it's very sloppy in so much it, uh, it there's a lot it feels like a lot of the um story behind it's missing it doesn't a lot of it doesn't really make sense and there's like a prologue set looks like it's in the 1920s which kind of links into something like stormbringer or day of judgment but then they're talking about but the characters are in that are also in the modern day and talking about oh yes 30 years ago this happened so it would have been the 60s or the, even the 70s. And so it doesn't make a great deal of sense. Um, um, but um, has anyone seen that, had the pleasure? No. No? No. no. Okay. Well, it's not a great recommend for me, but it's um, it's possible. Um, and it's got a few kind of... I mean, it comes alive at the end a little bit. Like, no film slash film can fail to come alive when you've got somebody carrying an axe chasing someone through the woodlands. You know, it's, it's kind of what the the slash movie is all about and so it has a few little frisons of you know entertainment towards the end of it but otherwise it's it's really ordinary street the whole way through so so not one i'd recommend but um if you're a masochist like most of us are and obviously we have just sat through skullduggery and a day of judgment so um so it might be worth checking out if you are but um but that's my recently seen so i kind of guess should we go on to our top three general horror films We'd like to see. Re- oh, actually, before before we do that, just very quickly, just going to mention a couple of trailers that I watched recently. I just wondered if you've seen it. One of them's um, you talk, Eric. You're talking about the um, uh, Sleep Tight, but there's a a trailer for a film called Mama, which I think is a remake of a Spanish short film. Have any of you seen that? No. No, it's worth looking out. It's kind of it's um it's it looks quite scary in the same way as like say the sinister trailer looked quite scary um and it seems to be the story of two young girls who are adopted um by this this couple and they've got a mama you know as uh, um but their mama may not be human and it seems to come back to reclaim them and that looks quite good um the other one of course is the big reveal was the world war z or world war z trailer i saw um, that one yeah yeah what did you think of that yeah it looks quite interesting um mm. I'm I'm not usually into big Hollywood stars, but I I kind of like Brad Pitt for some reason. He seems very likable. So mm, you know, mm. uh, and it does it looks it looks like it's a zombie movie on the scale of Independence Day or something like that, which could be interesting. Yes, I thought yeah. the trailer looked okay. I, I'm 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 a little oversaturated with zombies at the moment, but I thought the trailer kind of looked exciting a little bit. I guess. Mm-hmm. How about you, Nathan? Have you seen it? I haven't. Okay, no, it's worth checking out. It's on YouTube. Um, I mean, it's if you've read the book, it doesn't look anything like the book at all. And uh, in the book, they were kind of Romero-style zombies. I, I seem to remember. Whereas in this, it looks like they're kind of high octane, high octane running zombies. But, um, mm, but there seems hell. to be an awful lot of them. <laughs> it seems to be a lot of them, doesn't it? And also, it's um, it apparently it has been the production from hell. I was just reading up about it, and it's been um, they had seven weeks of reshoots and stuff, so it could be a complete disaster. But the trailer looks good. So, but anyway, that's uh, just an from, aside. It's from um, Mark Forster, who was the director of Quantum of Solace, which everyone thinks is probably one of the worst Bond, <laughs> Bond movies. That's why, that yeah. Yeah, so it's a bit of a strange um, choice, and apparently, yeah. So apparently, it's been one of those, one of those kind of cursed productions. So, um, but on from recently seen in trailers, um, we're going to do a top three, which I found quite difficult to do, and I believe you guys did as well. But it was a uh, was this a suggestion from somebody uh, somebody listening to the show that we did top three? Yes, films? someone sent in that they'd like to. They mentioned some horror films that they wanted to see remade, and then we just kind of went from there. Yeah, it's one of those things, isn't it? It's what's difficult is because everyone moans about horror remakes, 
Um, and so to actually then come out and say which three you, films you'd like to see remade, it kind of um, it kind of uh, sets you up for a fall. But um, well, let's um, let's start with Eric. Um, what was your top, your third? Okay, the third like one was, it's actually a film I really like, so, mm. I mean, again, I, as you said, I found this really difficult, but my number three is The Stuff, which is Larry Cohen's movie from okay. 1985, I think. Mm. Um, it's the tale of kind of this killer yogurt substance that has, uh, that they find bubbling up from within the earth and they market it, but not realising it has this addictive quality and also, you know, after a certain amount of time, it ends up eating you from within. Kind of, It's kind of like the blob, and that's what I, the problem I have with it is that I wanted the film to be probably more like Chuck Russell's remake of The Blob. Um, I think the film spends a bit too much time with characters that I'm not hugely interested in. Um, but I mean, I do like the film and I love the fact that a lot of the special effects in it are quite hokey. That's not the reason I want it remade. I suppose the reason I'd like to see it remade is I'd like to see it sort of uh, with a, maybe a bit of a faster pace. Hmm. It's not a film. I haven't seen it. I don't. I know no? of it. I know of mm. it. I remember reading about it in Fangoria, and I remember seeing the um, the adverts for it. But I don't mm. don't believe I've ever actually seen it. Mm. No, it is it is, it is fun. Um, and again, the only reason, like, probably more than a remake, I'd like to see maybe a re-edit. I'd like to see the same film only faster, maybe with certain scenes dropped and other scenes put in. If you know what I mean, rather than have the whole film made in a 2012 styley. Yeah. Yeah. No. Fair enough. I, I've um, actually funny. Just an aside. I did. I watched the Blob recently the remake mm. um from 88 wasn't it or something and um yeah, yeah i thoroughly enjoyed it it's was, it was good it was mm. a good time wasn't it but although um kevin dylan's mullet hasn't aged particularly well oh well i suppose it has a charm all of its own it does but they could have mm. done a film called the mullet couldn't they have just swapped it for the blob yes but, um <laughs> but, uh, how about you guys what about you nathan have you seen the stuff would you agree that it needs being remade i love the stuff i think it'd be interesting to see a remake hmm Mm -hmm. what about you joseph yeah i like the stuff a lot um as for it being remade uh, i guess i could see his point but i think it's fine the way it is Mm, okay i suppose it's kind of um although i haven't seen it i can imagine it's kind of larry cohen's kind of thing about mass consumerism isn't it is it kind of similar oh very much so yeah 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 Yeah. so he's got a strange sense of humor so i mean I, I, i wouldn't want that kind of humor to be lost in the remake i like his sense of humor Mm. wasn't wasn't larry cohen involved with um captivity that film or craptivity as it was called yeah i don't know why why would he be involved with something like that it's bizarre isn't it so yeah it just shows how all persuasive or all whatever um torture porn was for a while but um no thank you eric that's um interesting one to kick off with um joseph what's your number three well my number three is uh, um jeepers creepers 2 <coughs> and i this because I like the idea of these people being trapped on a bus and something outside the bus is trying to get in. And the film really didn't, you know, market, didn't really capitalize on that idea. I don't think it did. I mean, most of the death scenes are just, you know, the the creeper just zooming in and then picking someone up and flying away. And I, I really wanted to see some kind of, some really like outlandish death scenes. And I wanted, to, wanted there to be more suspense on the bus rather than, you know, a whole lot of, uh, gay slurs i mean the whole film is basically everyone calling each other gay and using that as insults and that it really kind of irritated me when i would really like to see you know uh these people banding together to figure out how to stop this threat so i mean i think it's an okay movie i mean it's certainly not great but yeah they should take that general idea and remake it Hmm. okay okay i haven't seen it for a, for a while um what, is there another one coming Third. Uh, there was supposed to be, but I don't know what the status of it is. Okay. Hmm. Hmm. What do you think, Nathan? I agree. I mean, I, I really I like Jeepers Creepers too, but um, I saw a lot of potential where it could have been a lot better than it really is. Hmm. How about you, Eric? Um, I didn't mind Creep Jeepers Creepers too. To be honest, I thought it was. Um... I thought it was an above average slasher. I remember Alan Jones, um, the UK critic really raving about it before it came out. Um, I don't think it quite lived up to that hype, but uh, mm. as for remaking it, I'm not 100% sure. Well, maybe with the third one, it will be a kind of... I mean, sequels tend to be in, you know, more or less remakes anyway, don't they? Except for Halloween 3. Except for Halloween 3, of course. Yes, yes. Okay. Well, thank you, Joseph. Um, Nathan, uh, what's your number three? Well, 
like we've said, this was not easy for me because I just could not think of any that, you know, I wanted to see remade. So, you know, I'm grasping at straws here and I really love demons and I don't think a remake could make it any better, but I would be interested in seeing like a, you know, seeing it on the big screen, I guess, like a, a newer version. I'm kind of curious. I'd love to see a, a movie in the theater that takes place in a theater. Hmm. I, th- I think that would be a lot of fun. And, you know, if they didn't go too crazy, I guess, CGI with it, I think it'd be a, a really good time, you know, just watching a bunch of demons attack moviegoers. Hmm. Yeah, definitely, because there's not really been... I mean, obviously, with what happened with The Dark Knight Rises, wasn't it? The um, That guy who shot the people in the theatre, they probably... Mm. There's been at least one film, hasn't there, that they've reshot the ending recently, which um, was, I think it was a gangster movie, wasn't it? But um, but in the past, there have been other films, haven't there? Like um, Anguish um, has got a similar kind of setup, hasn't it? And yeah. obviously Popcorn as well. And, of uh-huh. course, Movie House Massacre. Oh, yes, you the know. classic. Who can yeah. forget... Who can forget that classic? Yes. But, um, yeah, interesting, interesting idea because, I mean, Demons is so um, off the wall, really, isn't it? I've showed Demons because I got the Blu-ray recently and I showed it to some people and they they uh, they liked, they'd said it gave it a head, gave them a headache um, because it's just yeah. so frenetic. I mean, I love it. I think it's great. But, um, um, yeah, it'd be an interesting one for a remake. Uh, what do you guys think? Yeah, it depends on who's remaking it. If it was lots of me, like Paul W. S. Anderson, or is that that's the Ooh, Resident yes. Evil guy? I imagine it would be that would give me a headache. I imagine. Mm. No, no. Yeah, I kind of agree with Nathan. I, I really love Demons, and I, I don't really know if I want to see it remade. But if they could, you know, kind of just up the carnage and just kind of make it, you know, more frenetic, I guess it would be okay. It would be interesting to watch in the theater, like he said. Hmm. Okay. No, well, thank you, Nathan. That's an interesting one. And it's like you say, it's not like we're saying we want these movies remade. It's just like we are kind of a bit forced into a corner, really, aren't we, with a lot of these to um, choose. Although, having said that, my choice, my number three, um, is one I would like to... I would, in an ideal world, would have liked to seen a different version, different um, type, and that's Return of the Living Dead Part 2. Because... Um, I hated that, and I haven't seen it for so many years. Maybe I'd like it now. Maybe it's goofy, so goofy that I'd quite enjoy it. But I remember, and I've said it before on the podcast, so I'm not going to go on and on about it, but going to see it at the cinema when it came out in 87, 88, or whenever it was, and being hugely disappointed by how crappy it was compared to the first film. And what I would have liked to have seen was a, um, a sequel to Return of the Living Dead that managed to walk the tightrope between you know or the thin line between the the horror and comedy that first film managed so well because obviously the second film more just well uses the horror but uses the horror for comedy um and pretty much just goes straight over to the comedy thing with like the um you know the michael jackson zombie and all that kind of stuff i just i just remember hating it at the time and um i haven't i maybe watched it one or twice since and i've never warmed to it so i would have loved to have seen you know the team who made the first film making a sequel that um you know took the idea that the second film had but actually you know gave it a little bit more substance so that's my number three any do, any lovers of return of the living dead part two i when i saw it in the cinema in 1988 i loved it i have to say um and what subsequent viewings I didn't, yeah, I went about 10 years without seeing it then. And when I revisited it, I was absolutely shocked about how cheap it looked. Hmm. Um, but, I mean, I still have a soft spot for it, I think. I mean, it obviously is nowhere near as good as the original, but I think people are quite harsh on it. Okay. Oh, Nathan, doesn't Grant Grant prefer part two over part one? Yes, he does. <gasps> He's crazy. <laughs> I love part two. I think it's awesome. I don't really remember part two that that well. I mean, I remember bits and pieces, but I remember some of the comedy was really obnoxious. I just remember this. I mean, well, one scene that I always remember is where, um, you know, the guy's possessed and he's talking to his girlfriend. He's just like, if you love me, you'll let me eat your brain. And she's just like, oh, okay, then. (laughs) (laughs) You see, it is funny. (laughs) It's hilarious, yes, but um, okay, well, we are going on to our next ones. I think you know what is coming, don't you? Mm-hmm. Yes. He's a cat. Eric, what's your number two? My number two is 1994's Hellraiser 4 Bloodline. 
the reason for this is obviously it was famously a very troubled production. Kevin Yeager, the director, took his name off it and it's credited to Alan Smithy, the pseudonym that people used to use. Um, I used to love, the f- well, I still do actually quite like the first two Hall- uh, Hellraiser movies. Hello, Hellraiser 3, I'm not hugely fond of, but I thought... <gasps> yes, I know. Get over it. Um, Bloodline, oh, I thought... Hellraiser 3 is so fun. Uh, if you it's, fun so. or... it's fun. Or... I like Eric's fasty side. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Go, girlfriend. <laughs> yeah. Go over it, girlfriend. Um, I've lost my train of thought. Train of thought now. Um, Apparently, your talk- grammar. Well. Yeah, and my grammar. Um, <laughs> I was going to say, yeah, I like the the high the high concept. I mean, around that time, every horror franchise was sort of going into space. Leprechaun, critters, um, eventually Jason. Um, I thought Bloodline had lots of potential. When I heard Pinhead in space, uh, you know, I was immediately thinking, oh, this is going to be the best one yet. And of course, it turned out to be the worst. Um, I think the finished film is full of dull and interesting characters. It's a bit confusing. What I would do with the remake is drop all the um, the timeline stuff so I wouldn't have the, the 18th century or current day material. I'd have it all in space. And... I mean, I don't know how you would make that work because obviously it's very difficult, as we've discovered, to bring a, to put a horror franchise into the future and into outer space. Uh, nobody has done it successfully, as far as I can tell. Um, but if it could live up to sort of my hopes for it, it, it you know, I think Bloodline could have been excellent. Mm. Mm, I, I, I haven't seen it, no, so I cannot comment. Well, well, you're not missing anything really because it is a bit of a turkey. Okay, I saw it at the theater when it came out, and then that was it. I don't remember anything about it. Mm. I mean, actually that was probably the last that's probably the last Hellraiser film I've, I've seen I know they made right. like 10 more after that but I haven't yeah, seen but they, they, went, they all went straight to DVD the ones subsequent okay. ones mm-hmm. what about you Nathan I haven't seen uh, I haven't seen past part 3 okay well there we go well that probably does sound like it is one that should be remade so um, thank you Eric for your number 2 your big number 2 and Joseph I think you're up next <laughs> Uh, my number two is The Beast Must Die. It's from 1971, I believe. I could be wrong. Oh, yeah, okay. But, uh, but uh, basically, it's this werewolf film where, you know, it has audience participation where there's like five or six people uh, gathered together in this old house, and one of them is a werewolf, and you have to guess which one the werewolf is. And it actually has a werewolf break at the end. And I really think that's a great idea, but the problem is that I think this movie's not very good. I think the idea behind it is really good, but the movie's kind of boring, and there's not enough suspects. I, if I were going to do this kind of premise, I'd want there to be like you know a lot of people to guess from to make it more difficult to pinpoint who the werewolf is. And um, it's it's a movie that I'm kind of you know drawing a blank on remembering. If I recall correctly, not a whole lot of people die, so it's like. You know, it, it needs that body count as well. I mean, it's it's a neat premise, and I like the whole audience participation thing. I think they should really do something like that again. You know how in the 50s they had, like, you know, the, the tingling seats from the tingler, and then they had the smell thing from one movie, uh, and then this one you had to guess. I think they should do gimmicks like that again. I kind of miss that. Hmm. What, what's your thoughts? Have you seen it, um, uh, sort of, Nathan or Eric? I've wow. seen uh, The Beast Must Die, but what's weird, I mean, I don't remember much about it. I just remember that werewolf break. It wasn't very, I guess, memorable for me. What about you, Eric? I haven't seen it, to okay. be honest. So. No, I, I kind of really, funny enough, I, I really enjoy that film because I saw it not that long ago, actually, so it's quite fresh in my memory. And I remember watching it. Um, it used to play quite a lot on the BBC um, on their double bills in the kind of early 80s. I mean, it's awful. It's pretty awful. Um, but um, I love, you know, Calvin Lockhart's um, safari suit. He's kind of like the black Roger Moore. And um, <laughs> it's just kind of, it, it, it's just like a lot of fun and Peter Cushing. And it's, um, uh, I, yeah, it's, it's very, very silly. And the werewolf break was, um, you know, ludicrous, but... Uh, yeah, I really, I really liked it. Although it, it could be a fun film to be remade, so I'll give you that. So, excellent. Okay, well, thank you, Joseph and Nathan. I think a little bit of. Okay, Nathan. Um. Well, my second choice. Um. It actually, I, I, it is being remade, so I guess it was a good choice for me. But um, for the longest time, I always wanted to see Stephen King's It 
remade because you know I, I love the idea and you know when it originally came on it was a min it was like two movies you know it was like four hours it was like you know two movies and the first half where they're kids is excellent hmm. but the second half where they're adults it really just loses everything I mean it just I don't know it, it just didn't feel the same. Like I love the first half. Don't really like the second half. So <laughs> I think that's a common problem, isn't it? That's the same thing. Although I can't imagine anyone doing a better Pennywise than um, Tim Curry, but I might be wrong. Yeah. I mean, I agree with you there. He was excellent in that role. Um, mm. I don't know if anybody's going to be able to be better than him. I just, I don't know. I, I, and I haven't read the book, but from what I understand, a lot of people that have did not care for the way they ended the movie. So, hmm. Hmm. okay. It always reminded me of the horror version of uh, a Full Metal Jacket, like because, like Nathan said, the the part with their kids is great, but then the the part with their adults is just kind of meh. And that's how I feel about Full Metal Jacket, where they're at the boot camp, and then when it switches over to them out of boot camp in the army. I always found that to be like the the non horror version of it. I don't know, just a little aside there. Okay, okay, right. Well, uh, how about you, Eric? What are you, any thoughts? Uh, on that? I hated it, I have to say. <laughs> and even if it was remade, I'd have no desire to see it again. I'm sorry. You hated, you hated it. Yeah. You hated what? Mm. <laughs> oh. Who's on Joseph. first? Who's on first? <laughs> Right. Okay. Well, thank you. Do you know what I did? I liked. I liked. Quite liked the the Langoliers, whatever it was called. Okay. Uh, the the critters that eat time. But it. No, I didn't care for it at all. Even okay. the first half, I didn't care for. Right. Well, very strong opinions from Ireland there. So yeah. Thank you. Ireland says no. Ireland says <laughs> no. Nil pois. Nil pois. Yeah. He's so mad. <laughs> I know so, you mad. Yes. Mm. Okay. And so wait a minute, before you go f- any further, I think I must have missed it when I got disconnected. But what is this fast you're talking about, Eric? Oh, I have to get blood tests in the morning, so I have to. I'm not allowed to eat after eight o'clock tonight. Oh. Okay. Yeah, I know. Tell me about it. It's done. Yeah. Are you sitting there with a big bowl of chunky Kit Kats at the moment? Just making it <laughs> yes. Yes, well, that's good. Okay. Yeah. Well, here's, here's that cat. A big, a big trough. Yeah. <laughs> He's a cat. Okay. Well, my number two um, is a toss-up between two of them, but I think I'm going to go for, again, I found this very difficult to try and work out, but I thought it might be fun, and I'm not suggesting in any way, shape, or form this would be a good idea, but I would quite like to see a remake of Tombs of the Blind Dead. Um, mm. But with the the Knights Templar in a kind of modern ish setting, either in Spain or do it make it even more ridiculous and have it with the Knights Templar um, uh, interrupting a summer camp. I don't know. It could be you know ridiculous, but I just quite like to see them back on the big screen or the small screen, whatever. But um, but I think they're such great characters. It's a shame they haven't been um, utilised more. So so I think it would be really really ba- really bad dear to um, remake Tombs of the Blind Dead, but um, there's a, a kind of sadistic, masochistic part of me that would quite like to see it. What are your thoughts? Mm, I think that's a quite, quite yeah. a good idea, actually. Do I you? do too. I, th- I like the idea of the Knights Templar at a summer camp. That's that's really interesting. Oh, God, I would love it. I'd be the first I'd in like line to see their that. Opening night. I'd like to see the Blind Dead attacking uh, a version of America's Next Top Model, because that would be kind of like the Ghost Galleon in a modern day setting. Oh, that'd be awesome they too. Do. Oh, Knights be... Templar. I mean, all kinds of stuff like Knights Templar at a high school. Yeah. Knights Why are Templar we not making these movies? Speeding bus. Yeah. But Knights Templar in space. Yeah, Knights Templar in space. I love the <laughs> if idea. If this bus of goes the... below fifty miles an hour, the <laughs> Knights Templar will eat you. Yeah, but I love <laughs> the idea of um, Knights Templars on in um, the America's Next Top Model house. Or you could have them because they're obviously is they're because they're blind, aren't they? And they go by sound, so you could have them. At a a camp for people of Tourette's. <laughs> kind of that's that's a good idea. You know, yeah. <laughs> you know, what kind of a movie would it be if they were at a at a place where you know there's a lot of deaf mutes? It'd just be a lot of people standing around. <laughs> Not much happening. Yes. Yeah, that'd be the sequel. <laughs> yes. Okay. Well, there you go. So, who knew who would throw up such um, awful or but interesting ideas? So, um, okay. Well, let's move on to our number ones, Eric. What's your yep. big number one? 
my big number one is a film I've probably mentioned a few times before in the past. It's Cabin Fever, Eli Roth's um, debut movie. I think we mentioned before that it was completely missold. Um, I was not expecting when I went in to see a quirky, uh, offbeat comedy. What I wanted was, and this is what I would like from the remake, is I wanted Evil Dead style gore mixed with maybe the body horror of a David Cronenberg movie. But I wanted it to be fairly straight faced. Um, I could have done without the quirky humour and the obnoxious characters uh, and the surrealistic art house pretensions that were instilled in the movie. Um, so I'd like it remade as the film I was expecting when I went to see it in the cinema back in 2003, which is basically Evil Dead, but instead of um, spirits possessing people, you have a, this horrible flesh-eating disease, which I thought would could have been really fun and gruesome. Mm-hmm. Mm. Yeah, I mean, I haven't seen it since I saw it at the cinema, so I, I don't really remember it. I think I've kind of managed to blank it out a little. Mm. Um, I remember was. there's a sequence where this kid with a mullet is doing some kind of kung fu in slow motion, and I was like, for fuck's sake, this is, you know, I'm getting really angry now. <laughs> mm. My so problem I, I, with like, the film was, mm. was the cop character. Mm. You remember him? Yes, yeah. Yeah. But I've pretty much blanked out most of the movie. I saw it when it came out at the movies, but I refused to see it again. Mm. See, I'm kind of like um, with Cabin Fever. I really liked it when I first saw it, but the more I hear about it, the more I'm like, I don't think I would have liked that. So I'm like, I don't want to rewatch it because I'm afraid if I do, I will like it much less. I want to <laughs> maintain that I enjoyed it. Well, fair <laughs> enough. Fair enough. Um, yeah, because Nathan can't dislike anything. Well, we shall see. We shall see, won't we? Um, is there anything else yes. you want to say about it, Eric? Uh, no. 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 Okay, right. Well, Joseph, what's your big number one? Well, my number one is a movie that I've mentioned before, and that is Rawhead Rex. Mm. And I like this movie. I think it's a lot of fun. But I think this, the short story is infinitely scarier. I think, you know... Rawhead Rex should kill more children. I mean, he does kill one kid in the film, but he should, should kill more children. I thought the the costume in the movie would look kind of, you know, fake in, in, in most spots. I mean, from a distance it looked okay, but when it showed it up close, it was just really, you know, a guy in a rubber mask. And I thought, you know, some of the acting was a little over the top. I think the short story, if they'd, you know, use that template, you know, through and through, it could be a really scary film because the idea of Rawhead Rex is, I, I find just a big walking dick monster, you know, to be terrifying, you know. Ha, 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 ha. <laughs> mm. Yes. Yeah. Um, that's what he is in the short story. He's basically, you know, he's a giant dick. In the, in the short story, he, he really is a giant penis. He's a, is he? Yeah, he's it's sort of like a he's a phallic monster. He, he's mm-hmm. like a metaphor for going around raping and killing women, and he kills a lot of children, uh, it's, uh, stuff like that. But yeah, okay. uh, that, that would seen, be my number I've read one the book. remake. I've read the short story, sorry, from the Clive Barker short story years and years ago, so I need to revisit those. But yeah, um, so do I. Yeah. But yeah, that, that was that was filmed choice. just down the road from me, actually. Rawhead Rex. Was it? They yeah. using your relatives. <laughs> 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 oh, on. Joseph, you wag. I don't like grumpy Eric. I miss, you know, chipper I'm and not, I'm happy. not grumpy. I'm yeah, not you grumpy. are, because you're going to have to fast and that. You won't get any. He's, he's, well. Eric's being feisty. He's showing us his feisty yeah. side. Yeah, he's yeah, the the side. side. Yeah, I'm like I'm going to bed with his supper. Yeah. You'll hear my stomach rumbling all the way over there in Chattanooga. <laughs> <laughs> well, Nathan, what, did, what are your thoughts on Rawhide Rex? Oh, I love Rawhead Rex. I think it's uh, awesome. You know, uh, it'd be interesting to see, you know, uh, see it remade. Um, mm. But, I, you know, I just always have a soft spot in my heart for the original. Yeah, I do too. Don't get me wrong. I love the film. But, you know, as far as, you know, making something scary, that's why I'd want to see it remade. Okay. Fair enough. Fair enough. Okay. Well, thank you, Joseph. Nathan, what's your number one? Uh, my number one is Clown House. Okay. Um I think that the idea behind Clown House, I like the idea of three like deranged lunatics dressed as clowns and three brothers having to fight them off um, in this giant, ginormous house out in the middle of nowhere. I think that's a, an amazing idea. But I mean, in all honesty, because of what happened behind the scenes on that movie, um, you know, it's it's hard. It's really hard to watch it. 
Hmm. You know, because I mean, especially when you see the guys, you know, shirtless and, you know, like you actually see like one of the kids asses in one of the scenes. I mean, it's 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 kind of icky, I guess. I don't I mean, it's it's hard to watch it and not have that stigma attached to it because of what happened behind the scenes. I think that, you know, um, the idea behind the movie is excellent. And I would love to have seen like, you know. Um, like a remake, you know, of it, you know, by, you know, that didn't have um, all that horrible things going on behind the scenes. Hmm. Well, fair enough. Well, there's two Victor Salva films to be yeah. remade on this list, so that's obviously saying something. Um, what about you guys, Joseph and Eric? Any thoughts on Clown yeah, House? Yeah, um, I agree. I mean, I think the idea behind Clown House is great, but that whole um, what happened, it really taints the film. And another problem I have with Clown House is I think, you know, a couple of the characters, mainly the older brother, is so obnoxious that it's hard to, you know, kind of root for these children because you're you're basically wanting at least one of them to, you know, perish. But, you know, I think the idea of putting three clowns in a house is like three, you know, strong-willed, maybe kind of final girl types would be really interesting. Mm-hmm. Okay. What about you, Eric? I've never seen Clown House, believe it or not. Okay. Well, mm. fair enough. Well, thank you, Nathan. That was a good choice. Um, and mine, just to top things off, it's, well, I've talked about it before, but it would be, um, it's already a film that's already been remade, but it's a film that I would like to wipe the remake from the face of the earth, was the remake of The Haunting, um, which came out in at the end of the 90s, which was so, uh, we, I've spoken about it before on the podcast, and it was, it was the remake of the Robert Wise 1963 um, ghost movie, which is probably the, one of the best ghost movies um, ever made uh, with Judy Harris. And um, and then it was remade with, was it Lily Palmer? I can't remember her name now. The, but Lily Taylor. Of, lived, yes. Um, but she was the kind of like art house kind of um, darling, wasn't she at the time? And I thought, oh, if she's in it, it might be a quite a good film. And it, it wasn't at all. It was awful. But I would like to see The Haunting remade in the age of paranormal activity and insidious and sinister because the idea of, um, I, I kind of guess it's a similar idea to Grave Encounters of um, a group of parapsychologists going to investigate a haunting uh, house. It's been done to death, but um, in the age of that kind of the slow dread you know not seeing too much kind of scares of paranormal activity um and insidious and well to a lesser case sinister um could be quite interesting you know if they did if they did that so um yeah that's my number one although i don't necessarily think it's a good idea i just think it would be you know in a fantasy you know league type thing it might be quite quite interesting so any thoughts on that Mm. Yeah, I do agree the remake was tripe. Mm. I liked it. Uh, of course. <gasps> oh, Nathan. <laughs> really? Well, I mean, look, look, it's not anywhere near as good as the original. I'll give you that. Because the original did handle less is more, and mm. that is always better than too much CGI. But I just thought the remake was cheesily entertaining. Mm. Well, maybe I could watch it. Cheesily? Cheesily? Yeah, cheesily. I'm making up that word. Really? Thank you very <laughs> much. Well, maybe I could I look at it. want to fight uh, about it. Well, maybe if it, if there's um, there's some kind of apocalypse and there's just me left with one film in the world and that film happens to be the haunting remake and I watch it again, then maybe I can watch it with that in mind. But um, I think I don't think that day will come soon. But um, I like your positive positivity, yeah. Nathan, when it comes to that film and many of these films. And it will be remains to be seen because we're leading now onto our double feature, and it remains to see Yay. if you can keep that positivity up, Nathan. Yeah. Um, okay. It's it's not keeping it up, it, or it's not getting it up. It's keeping it up. The, it's, it's the hard part, or something. Oh, I don't know. I can't remember. Yeah, it, it's excellent. Well done, Nathan. Uh, well, it seems a little bit rickety, Doctor. Is it? Yes, but of course it's fairly easy to get it up. It's getting it to stay up. That's what counts. <laughs> yes. That's what I was going for. Yes. Yeah. Um, I, can we? Can we just? Have, um, I've just got a cat at the door. I just need to let a cat in. Is that all right? It's yes. Argento, and I'm just going <laughs> to... So, um, Come on if you in, talk kitty. amongst yourselves just for one second, I'll be back in a sec. Here, kitty, kitty, okay. kitty, kitty, not, kitty. And I just I'm heard one of my cats so go through a cat talking. door, so... It's an all-pussy show. Yeah. Why did you name your cat Philby? Philby? Yeah. I named him after Philby, the uh, character from 
uh, the time traveler, the character in Primer named his cat Philby that, so I named it Philby. I couldn't think of a name. Uh, what the well, other the cats? I was gonna, I was gonna name him Schrodinger, but I thought that was kind of everyone names their cat Schrodinger now. Do they? <laughs> Do they? Yeah. Yes, it's the Schrodinger's experiment about the cat being trapped in a box, and it could be dead and alive at the same time. Hmm. Well, I wonder if Justin's that... recording right now, because this is scintillating. I am recording. I haven't stopped recording. People, this is behind the scenes <laughs> of his series. You know well, the audience is going to love this discussion. Yes. I actually think sometime, Justin, you should leave it recording when we don't know, and then you should just release some special episode. <laughs> <It's> <laughs> an tank episode. And we're all fire. Well, I did, yeah. um, I did put that little extra Eric's horror thong at the end of the last one. So yes. if you stick around for the right to the bitter end of the podcast, because there's usually a little sting at the end of them. So, but funnily enough, the phantom pussy outside, I could hear scratching open the door. There was no cat there. <gasps> so spooky. <laughs> spooky, but I'm sure the little shit will turn up in a minute. So, um, it's Eric, nice. which one yeah. do you want to go with first? Um, which would you all prefer to talk about first? Hmm. Does it matter? <laughs> <laughs> Neither. No. Um. Oh, go on. Go on. Okay. Well, we go with Day of Judgment first, and then we can ha- we have an interview with Hans Manship to do, and we can do that, and then come back and do Skullduggery after that. So, uh, Day of Judgment, maybe. Okay. Well, here's the trailer for a Day of Judgment. A small American town, the late 1920s. They have deserted God, but God has not deserted them. A Day of Judgment. <laughs> Wait a minute, what was that? It's freedom. I'm selling the station, I'm selling the house, and I'm free. Where would we live? The county home. They did some stuff that the baby Jesus did not approve of. I worked and schemed to get this. If you knew the ways of the world, Mr. Morgan, you'd know that a man's work can be bought just like a coat or a piece of meat. See the film everyone is talking about. The film that Hysteria Lives described as having all the momentum of a slug on a skateboard. A day of judgment. It was an accident. You saw it. It was only an accident. No! What is it? I don't know what it was. There can be no justice for the citizens of a town where murder and violence have taken over their lives. Yes, I earned it. To get what I never had, I married an old man whose skin even smells musty. From director C.D.H. Reynolds, the ultimate day of terror. A day of judgment. Opening Friday at theatres everywhere, rated R. Wow, Eric. Where on earth did you pick that one up from? I love that. Yeah, that That was really good. Yeah, that was the original theatrical trailer. That was a TV spot from 1981. And rated R, really? Yeah, it was. It was intense. Um, okay, well, the, sheriff, judge... the sheriff's stomach was very traumatizing. Don't be mean. Don't be fattest. Oh, I'm sorry. The, the, the banker. I'm sorry. He was the sheriff in House oh, of yeah. Death. Yes, I know. I knew what you meant, actually. Um, well, A Day of Judgment follows the soap opera lives of the inhabitants of a small southern town in the U.S. during the 1920s. A priest has become disillusioned about how his flock have ceased attending church in favor of living more sordid lives. Each character has a secret or a diabolical plan, some of which involve financial gain, some involve intolerance, some involve revenge, but they all end up on the receiving end of the wrath of a scythe-wielding killer who may in fact be the embodiment of death. Um, This film, also known as Stormbringer, uh, it barely scrapes by into being classified as a slasher, if even a horror film, because the bulk of its 100-minute running time plays like an episode of Little House on the Prairie. Um, I didn't time the horror elements in it, but I imagine they take up about maybe five minutes of the entire film. Uh, the rest of the film is very much a drama and not a particularly involving one at that. Um, it's boring soap opera antics involving uninteresting characters who either owe money to the obese bank manager that Joseph was talking about there, or others you know who've been wronged by a spouse or a girlfriend. Um, I mean, it has a quirky edge, and at the start, um, as it's setting up each of the characters' various stories, you can see these three women dressed in black. Um, loitering in the background as we sort of learn sort of what the wrongdoings of each character are. Um, but I mean, waiting for something exciting to happen in this film is like waiting for Justin to admit how much he loves Toya. Um, it just takes forever. It's never going to happen. 
Yeah, exactly. Well, that's <laughs> it's, something exciting is never going to happen in this film. Uh, um, it just takes forever. And I mean, there's nothing in the film that even generates the mildest of suspense. M- possibly in the uh, the last 10 minutes, maybe. But uh, I mean, there is one scene I did like, and that's where um, the bank manager, Mr. Sharp, is in the ice house. And behind his back, you can see an out of focus figure walking towards him with glowing orange eyes. And I thought that was quite creepy. But I mean, that scene lasts, what, two seconds? And the rest of the film is like 98, 99 minutes. Um, it feels kind of like a Christian film. It feels like it was a moralistic tale. And it also feels at times like the horror element was shoehorned in, maybe long after the fact. They, I'm, I'm getting the impression, and I could be completely wrong, that the film was, was made as a drama. And then at the insistence of some producer, horror elements were put in to, to sell it as a horror because they knew they probably couldn't make their money back with selling it as a drama. Uh, I could be wrong, though. Um, it's an oddity for sure. I mean, it's not awful. I mean, it ha- it looks fine and it has great period detail, but it's just quite dull. Um, I mean, you have these characters, you're just not interested in this. Just talk, talk, talk for, you know, the bulk of the running time. As I said, there's the occasional bit of horror. There's one pretty nifty decapitation. But um, as I said, I don't think it qualifies as a horror movie, let alone a slasher movie. And I would uh, recommend it's one to avoid. So uh, what do you guys think? Justin? Me? Okay. Sorry, I've just um, sorry, I'm, I've just got a cat. Argento's done something unmentionable in the dirt tray outside. Again? Oh my god! I know. Um, but okay, well, taking over. While you no. are doing that, I will go over. No, to no, Nate. sorry. I'm going to carry on because I think I've the door. He's come in anyway, so I'm going to. I, I'm not sure. I could hear some scratching outside, so I'm not going to go into a blow by blow, um, um, monologue on that. So, but he's he's in the room anyway, so anything could happen. Um, <laughs> right, yeah, uh, Day of Judgment. I think as as you know, as um, amazingly, uh, the 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 makers um, uh, managed to see my my review for a crystal ball and said that um, it was a film with all the momentum of a slug on the skateboard, and it really is. I mean, it is like um, he said, Little House on the Prairie um, meets not even meets Crystal Lake. It kind of it kind of sees Crystal Lake through binoculars, perhaps, and then decides not to go there. Um, I mean, it, I. I can see what they were trying to do, um, and it was interesting for the time because I mean, very few films um, would have had the balls to, you know, on that kind of budget to try and do a period piece, uh, let alone a kind of slasher movie. And I think it's a shame that there were elements in it that w- worked really, really well from a horror point of view, and this idea of the Grim Reaper coming to town, and um, you know, the, the the priest doing the, the Christian thing by just letting everyone die um it was quite it was quite interesting and the, the the killer himself was was interesting um looking you know in a in a black long black cape and um in you know in that kind of um fedora and with a huge scythe and the in some instances glowing eyes and also he's got a bit of a cropsy-esque face isn't he it's kind of that kind of burnt face so it could have worked really really well but what you get lots of is very very boring um kitchen sink dramas in a kind of you know with all due respect to hands you know um who i think was the probably one of the best of the people in there it's there's a few kind of you know amdram moments which take you out of it and um you know just sort of you know the stuff like the you know the, the scenes with the granny with noodles the goat and things like that and um you know the kids and she kills the goat by poisoning the goat and then she gets dragged down in the ground by something or other um it's it's it doesn't really work but it's it's interesting it's not well, not interesting the film itself isn't interesting but the idea behind it i think is is interesting and it's maybe not way, as a morality play that i would be interested in because in as far as i'm sure eric you'll say what the ending is you know, in a little bit, but, um, um, the, I mean, I'll talk a little bit about, um, you know, we'll talk a bit about the background maybe, but also the one thing I would say is it inspired, I think, um, a goth band and I'll come on to that later. Ooh, I'm intrigued. Mm. Okay. Nathan, what do you think of Dave Judgment? 
Um, you know, I could see, um, I agree with a lot of what Justin said. I didn't hate a day of judgment at all. I mean, I don't really hate any movie, I guess. Um, and you know, I mean, it's biggest problem is that it's so boring. I mean, there are just way too many scenes where I just didn't care. And you know how you guys a lot say during my picks that, you know, every once in a while you'll start like looking at Facebook on your phone or something and you get, I mean, I was doing that a lot during day of judgment. <laughs> um, but it does have scenes that I really enjoy. Like I actually liked all the scenes with Mrs. Fitch. I thought her character was hilarious. I mean, she was so rude, like even to her, like uh, her maid, she was extremely rude to her uh, Mm. and, and like, you know, going so far as to kill the goat. And, you know, I love the scene though, where she gets her comeuppance and gets dragged uh, into the ground. I actually thought that was uh, interesting, but aside from the scenes with her, uh, most of the other movie just kind of dragged on and on and on until the ending, which, you know, I thought the ending was, you know, pretty good, but you know, it's um, it's it, it is a little bit of a chore to sit through the movie, but I think the filmmakers had their hearts in the right place, and you know, it's you know, it's uh, I like the Grim Reaper, and I like his weapon. Who are Mrs. Scythe? <laughs> uh, yeah, no, I, do, I, do, I don't argue that the, the filmmakers had their heart in the right place. I don't think the film, the film certainly looks good. It looks professionally made. Um, as you say, it just is a bit dull. I do like that character of Mrs. Fitch, though, especially when she speaks, the way she speaks to her maid, as you were saying, Nathan. Yeah. Um, the, ma- the maid is, is black and she says, um, Mrs. Fitch says at one stage, she doesn't appreciate being spoken to in that manner by her sort. I mean, she's just she's just That's asking awful. to be dra- dragged to hell, yeah. But another another line I liked was the the sheriff. He says at one stage to the kids who are you know supposedly tormenting Mrs. Fitch, he, he says to them, "Maybe next time I'll swim with you." To the children, and I think in this day and age that you can't say things like that to children. No, <laughs> might not. be just me. Um, <laughs> Joseph, I know you're a big fan of this movie, so here's your chance to defend it. Well, I watched it. I'd seen it a long time ago, but you know, obviously, I'd forgotten about it. So I watched it again uh, yesterday or the day before, back to back with Skullduggery. So um, yeah, actually, you know what? It's a movie. I, you know, like it's what you movie, said, right? I don't think it's, it's definitely, it definitely is a movie. <laughs> yeah. It, well, um, I was going to say it's a movie that I don't think is particularly awful, but it's just so dull. I mean. With you know, with all respect to Hans, who I think you know does a good job in this film, he's he's probably the best actor in the movie. I just didn't care about anything that happened in the movie, and I'm really hard pressed to remember a lot that went on. You know, aside from endless talk of uh, I need my farm, and no, I need the money. I'm the banker, and occasional glimpses of the the Grim Reaper, and I pretty much blocked most of it out of my memory. And uh, that's what happened. When I watched it like 10 or 15 years ago, I watched it and I was like, okay, no more. So now that I've, you know, watched it twice and we've documented it on the podcast, I'm going to say I'll probably never watch it again unless, uh, I don't know, unless someone puts a gun to my head. Mm, that's a bit harsh. Maybe yeah. could, maybe they, if they release that on DVD, they could put that as your quote. <laughs> I will never watch this movie again unless someone puts a gun to my head. Yeah. Says Joseph, <laughs> of the hysteria continues. Maybe we could do the commentary on it. <laughs> Maybe we could. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, listen. I'll I'll um I'll go ahead and give away the ending. So close your ears if you don't want the ending of the riveting day of judgment spoiled for you. But what happens is that it turns out to be a collective dream by all of the characters. Um, they uh, what happens at the end is that they all end up being taken to hell by the Grim Reaper, and hell, of course, is is some um, papier-mâché models and some red light, and that sort of constitutes hell. Um, but they all wake up, they've learned a valuable lesson, and they throng back to the church in their droves. Um, you know, it's, that's why we're saying it's kind of a morality tale and asking if this was perhaps funded by a sort of a Christian group who wanted to make a movie, because it certainly has that sort of after-school special, you know, morality going on about it. Mm. Well, it's, it would have been better, wouldn't it, if they'd um, suddenly all were in the shower together, like Bobby Ewing, <laughs> and they all walked out Ew, together in unison. I don't think, we, in some case, I don't think a couple of them would have fit in there. No. <laughs> <laughs> if it was a big communal shower, like in a, in a gym. Yeah, and yeah. they all walked yeah. out, and they all... Yeah. But, in a Spanish um, place or something. Mm. 
<laughs> Spanish what? <laughs> like a dark room. Like a sp- supermarket or something. Mm, well. um, <laughs> yeah, I mean, it do- uh, um, another film that pulls that trick is Nightmare City. So it would have been fun if um, they all woke up and then sort of the film started again and you had to watch the, the, the 90 minutes all over again. Well, they all sort of woke up and there was, was it Hugo Stiglitz standing at the end of their bed looking gormless. Yeah. <laughs> So, that would have been fun, yeah. Yes. Um, yeah, well that would have been that would be that would that was what I'd like to see kind of remake, wouldn't it? Or they could have the the zombies run in and sort of um a, like a the dance sequence like in uh, Nightmare City where they they attack the like dance the zombies boobs, attack the dancers. Yeah. Yes. That would have been interesting. But I did like I'll tell you what I did like was um the clown makeup on was it Mitzi? The the trollop. Oh yes, yes, yes. Her, yes, yes, her yeah. lipstick was just yeah. like it was like Dina Martina's lipstick. It was huge. It was just like <laughs> really kind of exaggerated, like mouth, um, like she was shot with Homer Simpson's makeup gun. Yes, that was that was. <laughs> you had it set to really horror. <laughs> yep. <laughs> <laughs> the other thing, watch I, I, um, because I've got the. I mean, I actually own this movie on VHS. I have it under the title Stormbringer. And it got released in UK um, on Tower Video back way back when it was a preset, so it was um, it was a long time ago. But um, I watched it, and there's th- there's the one gore effect, isn't there, where somebody gets decapitated with the scythe? Now I was just interested to know whether or not the versions you saw, you actually see him having his head chopped off, because in the version I have, you the scythe, you see the scythe raising up, and then you see his head on the ground. With blood dripping onto it, and him blinking. Yes, yeah. Is that it? <laughs> um, as far as I remember, you do see his head being chopped off. Do you not? Am I mistaken? I don't know. Didn't Joseph Nathan? Can you remember? I don't remember. Mm. <laughs> I know. I watched it recently, and I don't remember anything except Mrs. Fitch. I'm trying to forget. <laughs> <you here. laughs> Come on, it's not that. I think we've covered plenty worse than than Day of Judgment. Actually, yeah. is that a crack at me? Oh, Eric, fight, actually, to give fight, Nathan fight. his due, I don't think even his picks have been, you know, at least they've been entertaining in a bad way. This is just dull. Oh. I know Eric. Eric's thinking about Crazy Fat Ethel, too. I am. That's exactly what's in my mind. <laughs> but There's what, no yeah. forgiving that film. Um, <laughs> well, I'm thinking the reason we, in some ways, I mean, it is, it can. I, it wraps itself up as a little bit of a, as a slash movie, but I thought it was interesting. If you see the poster for this film, it has the tag light, the night he came to collect his own. I noticed that, yeah, as if they're trying mm. to market it to the Halloween crowd. Yeah, yeah to sort of try I like and make the out the it's The tagline that's uh, maybe on your VHS, it says Stormbringer, but the calm never came. That's yeah. exactly what's on there, yeah. yeah. Full tagline, actually. Mm. And there's it another is. tagline on another poster for it under the Day of Judgment title saying, With his powerful scythe, sinners are awarded their just punishment. Mm. Mm. I mean, the thing is, there's quite a lot of, um, there's a place where, you know, Baby Jesus lives, as some of you may know, where you can find films where there's quite a lot of um, religiously backed movies, isn't there, even being made now. And a lot of them are kind of, there seems to be like a, a glut of ends of the world style Armageddon Christian movies, which I've not seen any of. But again, I think it kind of harkens back to um, um, what you're saying, Eric, about whether or not there was... You know, it, 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 you know what what this was. You know what the idea of it was. Whether or not it was a a Christian morality play that was shoehorned onto a horror film, or you, you know, I mean, the thing is, I mean, do you want to talk a little bit about the background, Eric? Well, I have very little background, but fortunately, Joseph uh, has mm. an interview with Hans Manship, who plays yes. Morgan in the film, and he more or less says everything that I could dig out of the film. All I will say that Hans doesn't say is that um, the music is by Arthur Smith, who was very most famous for writing the Julian Banjos theme from Deliverance. I think he probably made a pretty penny out of that because it's used in a lot of films. Yes. Mm. Okay. Well, yeah. But but for most of the cast and crew, this seems to be their only credit. Okay. Mm. Well, shall we go to the interview of Hans? Yes. Yeah. Sure. Okay. Well, let's, um, Joseph, do you want to introduce your interview? Yeah, I mean, we've spoken to Hans before during our House of Death episode, but, you know, he was kind enough to 
talk to me again to get a little background information. He's a really good guy. So uh, this is the interview with Hans Menship. Okay, here we go. The Hysteria Continues is proud to welcome back Hans Menship. We had him on the show about, oh, close to two years ago. Um, we were discussing House of Death. And today we're going to talk to him about A Day of Judgment. So to start off, uh, welcome back, Hans. And can you tell us which film came first? Was it A Day of Judgment or House of Death? Well, if memory serves me well, Joseph, A Day of Judgment came first. Uh, it was shot in 1980, released in 81. Even though the two films were produced by separate companies, I kind of think that being seen in the first film helped me get cast in the second. The film industry is, is a lot smaller than people think, and to have a good reputation and to... To work at your craft, um, it really helps you get hired down the road. All right, excellent. Um, let's talk a little bit about financial backing. Um, who bankrolled A Day of Judgment? Well, the film was produced by Earl Owensby. He's, he was known as the Cecil B. DeMille of the South, and he probably funded the entire film by himself. He had made uh, quite a bit of money, if I remember right, in... Uh, the industrial tool industry, and decided to start making movies. The film crew was mostly his on-site team that were from the region, and he would pull them together. He used a lot of the same people, and they were they, they knew what they were doing, and they were good to work with. As an aside, Joseph, IMDb, you know that website? It's, it's a great website for film and TV, a lot of good information. Well, IMDb has the film location set in Wilmington, North Carolina, uh, but that's incorrect. Now, Dino De Laurentiis had built a film studio in 1983, a couple years later. He had built this for the movie Firestarter, starring George C. Scott and, and a very young Drew Barrymore. I think it may have been her, her uh, next film after E.T., but sometimes the two North Carolina studios would be confused with each other. Well, Earl Owensby, he was his own man, and he succeeded in bypassing film establishment by making many films. They were low budget, but he was successful in marketing them in drive-ins all around the South and the U.S., and I think he had a lot of uh, overseas marketing. He built several full-size sound stages. He had a big underwater filming tank, which, by the way, James Cameron used in his really good film, The Abyss. And he also built a private motel for performers or guests. So I always admired Earl Owensby for his maverick accomplishments in the film industry. Do you know if Earl is still involved in the industry? You know, I... I have a feeling that he does still uh, have his studios. I checked out his website not long ago just to, to refresh my memory, and I think he's renting it out to films for commercials and films, so he's still, he's still going strong. All right. How about behind-the-scenes information on A Day of Judgment? Anything you think might interest our listeners? Well, there are a few bits and pieces that I have remembered. Um, I remember the closing scene in the film was the very first scene that I shot, and actually most of us shot. Uh, it's the scene where they brought all the repentant sinners together uh, with their victims for a church service. The new pastor in the church was a pivotal character, and he was introduced in this final scene. It's kind of a twist. Now, my characters, it was actually one of several plot lines that were interwoven in the film, which was set in a small southern town in the 1920s. I played Morgan. He was a hard-working farmer trying to survive droughts and insects, and very lean times, very much like the Depression. My wife had died years earlier, and I was, I was alone. Well, there was a greedy banker, uh, Mr. Sharp, played by William Hicks, 
And he took advantage of the situation, and he foreclosed on the farm. So he now left a desperate man in a desperate standoff with uh, with the sheriff. So it was an interesting, interesting role. The sheriff was played by Jerry Rushing, and I was told that the actor-writer Jerry Rushing was the creator of the TV series The Dukes of Hazard. He had come up with the idea. Um, another bit of information, the ice house on my farm, on Morgan's farm, <laughs> it was nothing more than a framed door on the side of an embankment. You open the door and there was a, there was a grass there. The interiors to the ice house were shot elsewhere. And the scene in the ice house where I returned to seek revenge on Sharp, uh, that was not me. I had returned to Hollywood, and I think the director placed a technician in my wardrobe. And remember those red glowing eyes? <laughs> and uh, they had finished the scene. I was, uh, it was a very busy time for me. I had been contracted as executive director and to also play a major role in an outdoor pageant called The Legend of Tom Dooley that was in Wilkesboro, North Carolina. It was a couple of hours away. So I would do the uh, Legend of Tom Dooley at night and then drive a couple of hours to the EO studios to shoot uh, Day of Judgment. So it was a, uh, it was a challenging time, but hey, I was happy to have the work, so it was great. I shot the film under the name of Bud French, and that's a stage name I sometimes use based on my two favorite theater professors back in my uh, school years. The director of the film, uh, he was billed as C.D.H. Reynolds. Uh, we knew him as Charles. He also played the role of the retiring Reverend Cage. So that's uh, that's a little inside information that I remember. There's a couple of House of Death crossovers. Uh, William T. Hicks, Helene Tryon. Uh, she played Lily's grandmother, I think it was, in House of Death. I spotted them in The Day of Judgment. Um, any other House of Death connections uh, besides them and yourself? Well... Both films, they were shot at uh, EO Studios, like I said, about 50 miles from Charlotte. And although there were a few local and regional actors that appeared in both films, a few of the stars in House of Death, <clears throat> and also the director, David Nelson. Remember Ozzy and Harriet? David was uh, Ricky's brother, uh, and he directed the film. So... They were cast in Hollywood, as was I, and other actors came from Atlanta. But almost all of the actors in A Day of Judgment were from the North Carolina region, Charlotte. The uh, the screenwriters, the producers, the directors, they were all different in the two films. All right, and um, how about your preference? Uh, House of Death or A Day of Judgment, which do you feel gave you a uh, stronger character to work with? Well, man, that's a it's not an easy question there, Joseph. <laughs> it's kind of like comparing apples to oranges for me. Both were major roles that I could really sink my teeth into, yet they were both different. Morgan, on the one hand, in the Day of Judgment, was a, a poor, distraught farmer in his 40s. And then Casey, from House of Death, was a brain-damaged youth and prime suspect for the murders. So there was quite a, a bit of age difference in the two, and both were, eh, they were wonderful characters. But I guess I lean a little towards Day of Judgment. Uh, I liked the premise of the film, since it was basically good overcoming evil, uh, repentant hearts. It was about forgiveness, reconciliation for, for everyone, everyone in the town. Reminded me of the Old Testament city of Nineveh, an entire town that was saved from destruction. So the film actually closes with the Ten Commandments scrolling up the screen. And that was that was a surprise ending. The plot line appeals to what I personally came to believe in my in my thirties. I am now on the other side of the camera, the microphone. I work in the 
administrative side of radio. So for 30 years, I've been involved in Christian ministries that work in third world countries. We work in about 30 different countries helping the poor and some really hard hit people in very poor countries. So it's it's been very rewarding for me, quite different from my days as an actor and a director. Do you still do any acting, or have you pretty much said goodbye to that portion of your life? Well, uh, it's an industry and a business that is very easy to, to get out of. <laughs> if you If you stop your push to be involved in something, you don't usually get too many calls. So I haven't done too much. I, I've done a couple of things that uh, that uh, I felt good about. I did a couple of voiceovers and such, and uh, but but uh, not too much in the last thirty years. I'm very content with being on the administrative side and, and working in Christian ministry. Very content with that life now. All right, Hans. Well, it was very good to have you on the show again. Um, everyone on the show is looking forward to hearing from you. So a big thanks from all of us at the Hysteria Continues. Terrific. Listen, thanks for the opportunity. And uh, it was fun looking back on on some old times that were a lot of fun. So keep in touch and keep up the good work, Joseph. Letting the fans know uh, all about the inside of the crazy world of filmmaking. So, bless you. All right, and that was the wonderful Joseph Henson speaking to that guy, Hans Manship. <laughs> no, I got that backwards. So I'm sorry. Hard. Yeah, I got that backwards. I'm sorry. That was Hans Manship. Uh, he's a good guy, and I was glad to speak with him again. Yeah, thank you, Hans. Um, but mm-hmm. um, that's indicative of why we don't get very many interviews, isn't it, Joseph? <sighs> Oh, hey, it's but, not um, for lack of trying. No, no, it's not for lack of trying. But um, we hopefully we will talk, we'll be well. We'll get some more people for you. But um, Arshento is back in the room, and oh, you, Arshento, you come here, good boy. Um, and um, I just want to apologise to Arshento. He he didn't actually do anything unmentionable, so I do apologise for that to him. Yeah. Um, Eric, mm. anything else you want to say about... No, um, but I, sh- I should have explained the reasoning behind the double bill. Why have we paired up a day of judgment with Skullduggery? Um, yes. I was just going for two weird, I suppose, in inverted commas, slashers. Because, I mean, a day of judgment is, as we said, kind of boring. But it does have kind of this strangeness to it. Not as strange as Skullduggery, which we're going to come on to in a few moments. But that's the reasoning behind pairing the two together. And also the fact that background information on both films is, is kind of limited so we knew we probably needed a, a second feature to to back them up mm, mm. Mm. i mean so i wonder do we do we know whether or not um stormbringer ever got to oh, sorry the day of judgment ever got a any kind of release i kind of guess it must have done must not it uh, maybe yeah, driving, cinema yes. release yeah, yeah because um, hans was talking about how uh, earl owensby was kind of this uh king of you know selling his films to drive in so i'm assuming it probably went to a few God, over imagine? here over here though all i could see was that it went straight to video in 1986 87 was it right oh, okay yeah as the stormbringer and surprisingly unsurprisingly i should say no cuts were made <laughs> oh actually so that would explain yeah that would explain it justin that what you saw as a stormbringer is exactly the same as what we saw as dave judgment that would explain the gargantuan running time <laughs> yeah, I mean, for for whatever ninety nine minutes, it does feel like two hundred. <laughs> Mine was the copy I was one hundred and five minutes. <laughs> well, maybe it's just more talking. Yeah, could be. Mm-hmm. But you know, you guys mentioned earlier the connection to um, the tagline. Kind of made it sound like the tagline to Halloween. Mm. There's also another connection to Halloween, Ooh, and that the is the killer quote unquote in this movie is a grim reaper and in halloween they feature a song called don't fear the reaper oh very good actually i just know it i know another connection to halloween yes this film we're we're covering and last film we we covered was halloween Mm, i've got another one in this (laughs) film there's a car and in halloween there's a car blah 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 etc etc well from uh, Day of Judgment. It, has a, it also has a link to um, Nocturne by Susan the Banshees because they're both shite. <gasps> I'm only joking. I'm only joking. I take it back. Mm. Shall we move on to your second pick? Yes, I have more to say about the second one. So. Well, because we're up to an hour and a half already. So well, let's get on to, and this is, again, Eric, amazingly 
found the this yes. um, trailer, yeah. a very very rare trailer here we go. for Skullduggery, and here it is for the first time ever. In a world of Dungeons and Dragons, he was not gay. No, I'm not gay. I just feel uncomfortable. He thought that something strange was going on. Something strange is going on, Adam. It's so confusing. <laughs> no, I, I'm seeing things, and I, I don't know if they're real or if I'm just imagining them. I don't understand myself anymore. I took care of the white sorceress, thereby eliminating her enormous powers. Uh, uh, uh. Really? Did you have a good time doing it? <laughs> we should all be paid 100,000 gold pieces now. What's wrong with you, man? Why don't you wake up? Then someone said something really weird about a bus. Wanna watch me suck a greyhound bus through a straw? And they said something <laughs> even more bizarre about a raccoon. I've got a raccoon in my pants, would you like to set him free? I have an idea. I know a fortune teller. I'm gonna phone Madame Cardoche right now and make an appointment for you after work, okay? Because I think she can really help. My father's name was Jeremy. How did you know that? Have a small wart under your left arm pit. Your life is a puzzle only the devil can solve. Where the usually peaceful Trottleville has been hit by two sudden and unexplained deaths in the past two days. The first was an 18-year-old girl who died of a heart attack on stage during a junior college theatrical performance. Madame Cardoche, the established fortune teller, also died of heart failure. The most terrifying film of the year, Skull Duggery. I'm the only virgin at this party. Stop. Don't stop. Don't stop. Oh. Doctor, you're the best in this room at this time. Meryl Streep. She doesn't have half of what I have. You're right. She has to get by on talent. You will never forget the horrors that you witness in Skull Duggery. Can I have my pants back now? Rated R. Mm, rated R again. Rated R. <laughs> <laughs> You know, the announcer is brilliant. He really oh, he sells is. the film. He's mm, like, he has a Don very, very believable American accent. Mm. I know. Really. I, I wasn't trying for... I know, I, he wasn't trying for an American accent from what I read. <gasps> Wait a minute. You <gasps> said, ah, did you just... No, I meant away? I meant he. So. You meant Derek. Derek Thrawfall. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right. Yes, Derek. evil twin. Um, okay, well, that was the... Uh, <laughs> Original theatrical trailer for Skullduggery. Uh, this is the story of Adam, who's this Dungeons and Dragons enthusiast in the town of Trottleville, uh, which I assume is made up. Uh, he's unaware of the fact that an ancient curse was put on his family back in the 15th century. And one day, whilst trying to defend himself from evil orcs using the Cloak of Chaos or some such shit, he begins to act strangely. Before long, he begins acting out his board game assignments for real. For example, murdering a nurse when his board game task was to slay the sorceress in the white dress. As for the rest of the plot, uh, well, I think it's best summed up if I say a wibble wibble, swordfish, banana hair extensions, <laughs> hovercraft, monkeys, bumhole, oven ready roller skates, <laughs> who glued the teapot to grandma's head? Um, which I think is a fair assessment because in the last half hour of Skullduggery, things do get very, very weird indeed. Um, for the first hour, I could, I could follow the plot, even if it was bonkers. But um, there's a point in the film where Adam, the lead character, goes to a party at Dr. Evil's residence. And I'm not making that up. Before Austin Powers, this was the first film that introduced us to Dr. Evil. Um, just the film goes off on just bizarre tangents. Um, I guess they were trying to create a, f a sense of unease, but I think they just go a bit too overboard. Um, I mean, the film just ends up making no sense to me anyway whatsoever. Uh, maybe it's just that the film is too arty and highbrow and I don't get it. I don't know. However, I do love the fact that this film is so unique, even if it's not wholly successful. I do think it deserves one viewing. Uh, for me, it, it certainly deserved multiple viewings because it's just so off the wall. Uh, it's one of a kind. Um, the film really only has two main characters, the aforementioned Adam and his co-worker, Barbara. And she's also, she also takes part, in, takes part in the Dungeons and Dragons sessions they have. Uh, neither of the characters have any real depth. 
But uh, they're far more fleshed out than sort of the dozens of people who just wander in and out of the plot, you know, for no reason, just to add sort of general weirdness. Like there's this man in overalls that has a knots and crosses board on the back. And every time he appears, another square is filled in. Uh, And I'm sure that probably has some significance. What it is, I have no idea. Uh, Maybe some of you guys might have a theory about what that is. Um, Of course, there's the famous scene of um, the Liberace lookalike who... (laughs) Um, yes. the, the girl is fleeing from Adam who is chasing her with a scythe uh, she knocks on this church for help uh, inside there's not a priest no in this church there's a Liberace lookalike playing a piano that sounds like a church organ and he just gurns incessantly at the uh, at the camera and continues playing this piano uh, for what reason who knows um and then at regular intervals, the, the camera cuts to this unseen person assembling an Adam and Eve jigsaw, which consists of about six pieces. It's kind of like a um, Duplo. Uh, is it Duplo I'm thinking of? It's kind of a child's jigsaw. Mm. What that has to do with anything, I have no idea. Then there's the omnipresent Jester doll, who we see also in the prologue set in the 15th century, and he, or it, makes an appearance throughout the film. Uh, and what about the doctor, dressed as a, not a doctor, but a gorilla smoking a cigar? Uh, and then you have a whole sequence set in an amateur theatre night in a local school um, with, where the acting is bizarrely sort of inept and the plays themselves look incredibly bo- dull and stupid. Um, what that has to do with anything, I have no idea. Um, is the film art? Uh, I am not sure. Um, I mean, there has to be some rhyme or reason behind its weirdness. But uh, I think, are they trying to channel David Lynch? It's, it's, it's strange that, that they tried to make an art film out of a Dungeons and Dragons themed slasher, which would seem to me to be more of a commercial uh, premise. But I don't know. I mean, but if you're feeling adventurous, I think there is enough silliness, weirdness and occasional bits of horror in Skullduggery to warrant a viewing. And it has the best theme song ever, as I've said before. So stay tuned to the end credits of the podcast. Um, Joseph, did you have any more love for Skullduggery than you did for A Day of Judgment? Well, at least with Skullduggery, um, I, I couldn't call it dull Skullduggery because it's, I mean, it's not boring. It's just so bizarre. There's no coherency whatsoever. So, I mean, the whole time I'm sitting there like, what the fuck am I watching here? So, I mean, I don't know. I didn't really care for it, but at the same time, I can't really not recommend it. I mean, you have to see it at least once. So, I've blocked most of it out of my memory except for, you know, him doing his little magician skits near the beginning and the whole – I like the scene where – the girl's getting the massage and it's him doing it. And this woman comes here. She's get out of here, you pervert. And she flips her. She's like, who is that? She's like, Oh, just some guy. And then she puts the little patch over her, the JJ area. <laughs> but, <laughs> I don't know. It, it's not boring, but it's just so bizarre and so incoherent that it's not really something I'd want to watch again. So take that for what you will. Okay. Well, I'm going to actually shake my dice for the next one. This is for you, Nathan. I'm an elf with four hit power. Well, you've you've got an eight, which means the dwarves of Nebula, um, they've waved their magic wands and they've appeared in your enchanted castle. And the only way to defeat them by using your cloak of invisibility is to give me your opinions on Skullduggery, Nathan. Oh, okay. Um, well, um, I could not make a whole lot of sense out of the movie, but I mean, I thought that a lot of it was um, kind of entertaining in, you know, the a cheesy way. I mean, who could not love characters like Mr. and Mrs. Bull? I mean, <laughs> those two people, like, they're so random and ridiculous. And him drawing on the bunny rabbit suit. I, and I love the, you know, where he's, uh, I think he mentioned something about seeing a psychologist or psychiatrist or something. And I think Barbara says something like, oh, that's just a bunch of bull. But let me set you up with my fortune teller. I mean, <laughs> yes. yeah, I mean, that's much more believable there. Um, and of course, like you said, the whole him chasing um, the nurse and then her running to the, you know, next door to that uh, church with the piano player. I mean, it's so weird and random. And I don't know, I kind of got a lot of enjoyment out of it just because of how bizarre the whole thing is. But ultimately, I have to say, I don't really care for Dungeons and Dragons. I never played the game, so I don't really understand it. Um, I know that you. Um, 
it's like a wizardry thing or something, but I'm not into that kind of stuff. Um, you know, and, you know, I have to say the highlight of the film for me was Mr. and Mrs. Bull. Hmm. Well, I have, I did play Dungeons and Dragons once against my will when I was young. Uh, I think I'm on sort of the first or second turn. I ended up in some kind of pit of darkness and uh, I needed to throw a certain number on the dice to escape and I never did. So I basically just sat there doing nothing for about three hours. Oh, so that, that, Yes, it was very boring. But now it's time to roll the dice for, for Justin. Oh, it's a four, Justin, which means you're fall into the well of doom. And the only way to escape is to appease the beautiful princess Toya with your, with your opinions of skullduggery. Well, I don't think that's right, actually, Eric. If you've read the rule book, it means that there are goblins in Toya's Lady Garden. <gasps> no, so, no such. Are they Susie goblins? <laughs> I don't know. Um, cheap goblins, anyway. Um, so, yes, but I, funny enough, I played Dungeons & Dragons when I was when I was a kid. and um, Well, actually, older than a kid, actually. It's probably a teenager. And uh, Yesterday? Yes, it was just a few years ago, and uh, uh, and I used to really enjoy it. It was kind of it was good fun. I mean, it was kind of you had to use your your mind, I kind of guess, because obviously you couldn't see stuff. But it's lots of rolling dices and played Call of Cthulhu, which was the Lovecraft one set in the nineteen twenties, which is much more much more horror based. Which I got into that for a while, but um, but Skullduggery, you know, what can I say? I mean, it is as Eric said, it's kind of one of the strangest. Um, and everyone says one of the strangest slasher movies, um, you know, out there. I mean, it's it's just it's just bonkers, and it just you just kind of can't really get my I can't really get my head around how it got made. You know, whoever thought this was a commercial idea? I mean, I think you know you, you you're saying Eric, it's you've got the kind of art house almost. I mean, it's not art house really at all, but it's it's so bizarre that it kind of it verges on art art house. But the the Dungeons and Dragons angle obviously was a commercial. Um, no, because wasn't there another film with Tom Hanks, wasn't there, which is like a Dungeons and Dragons? Mazes and Monsters, was it? Yeah, which wasn't a slasher movie, but that was... Uh, so there were the films around it at this time, and obviously that's what I thought would be um, a good idea. I mean, I think I think it was sunk, unfortunately, by the, the, the main character, it was a Tom Haverstock who played him, um, and it, he he just doesn't his expression just stays the same throughout the movie whether or not he's being nice at the beginning or he's possessed or he's killing his he, he does his his um face doesn't change at all uh so that's very strange but then you have these sequences which are kind of almost like an early 80s pop video aren't they like um when the the liberace moment which is obviously completely bonkers but then the woman runs past the grave where they're ba- burying someone. It's like some kind of weird blondie video, and they, and then these old women sounds say something. Was it along the lines of, "Does she think we're in a fucking Rolling Stones concert or something?" Yeah, I mean, yeah. It's bizarre. Mm. And then you have, I mean, you have these great moments of inspiration, like the, um, you know, the the Easter Bunny slasher, the bunny with a flick knife, which I thought was great, um, and the killer killing a disco bunny on roller skates with a meat cleaver and then putting her in the oven i mean a lot of it is kind of does he does he put her in the oven or is it just the skates maybe it's just the roller skates yes i mean i thought right at the beginning it's what's bizarre it's it says like canterbury 1382 or something so it's supposed to be like exactly what sort of um 700 years or whatever 500 years before yeah is it five yeah 600 years sorry 600 yes um and it's kind of, it's acted, it's, you know, it's almost, that is almost, I was thinking when I was watching it again, is this meant to be a play and they're going to pull away? Because they have the, the queen who is, is so literally wooden an actress, isn't she? She, I mean, mm. she faints, but she just. And she's, she looks like a guy in drag, I thought. Yeah, but exactly. But just sat there and it's almost like somebody watching a soap opera, like not actually in a soap opera, but watching one. That's uh, that, as yeah. much interaction she has with what's going around it. It's just like, uh, and then someone shouts, fall over, and she just kind of flops to one side. I mean, <laughs> it's it's very bizarre. Um, mm. And then, of course, they've got this whole, the first um, third of the movie is this kind of like endless skits, isn't it, of this kind of this amateur dramatic society where they've got various people going on stage and doing their magic show or or various things like that. And it kind of... I mean, it's threaded throughout all of that. You've got, obviously, the main character who is then 
possessed, as it turns out, killing people. Um, but what makes it kind of metaphysical, if that's the right word, but it's that kind of or whatever, esoteric or whatever it is, but is he kills people, but when he kills people, they, when they're found, it's kind of this, it's as if they've died of a heart attack, isn't it? Mm, yeah. Certainly, the first, well, certainly first initially it is anyway. Yeah. yeah. Um, so it's, it's a very strange movie and I don't really understand what they were going for. And I think, I mean, the, without, I mean, you might have some more backgrounds on this and I'm, I haven't got very much at all, but, um, um, I did see it listed in variety at the time as a comedy thriller. Not a <laughs> well, be about right. Yes. So, so that was obviously what they were going for. So I think a lot of that was meant to be a comedy. And sometimes it's quite difficult with really bad movies to work out what was meant to be funny and what is unintentionally funny. And I think. Well, while um, we're on that point, do you want to play mm. that clip, the dialogue gag, gag clip? This is supposed. I think I, I assume this is an intentionally funny moment in the film. Har har hardy har. Hi, you've just called dialogue. <laughs> What do you call a person that can't read in two languages? A bilingual illiterate. <laughs> Was that a good one? Okay, here's another one. Okay. I mean, I can imagine how much it costs to dial that premium number. <laughs> and, and, and that's the quality of joke you get? Yes. Mm. Hardy, hardy, har. Hardy, I mean, it's the most hard. absurd sort of camp accent possible when you mm. when they phone that line. And speaking of which, there's also that camp guy you heard in the montage at the start who says... This low budget crap wouldn't buy a bag of horse shit or something like that. Uh, and as that voice is speaking, you see two sailors applying lipstick to each other. Um, now, I mean, I can't even believe I've said that sentence. I mean, it makes no sense. And that's just epitomizes skullduggery. It's kind of like a fast binder slasher movie, isn't it? It's almost like he wanted to make Quirrell or something rather than um, Friday 13th. Yes. Mm. Well, I mean, I have this theory that there is this kind of homosexual sub subtext going through it because um, uh, Adam, the character, says at one stage he, uh, he's seduced by this nurse he meets at the, the hospital after slipping on his arse on some wet floor. Um, and she asks him, are you gay? And he says, I'm not gay. I'm just, I just feel uncomfortable or something. And then later in the film, he could, because he works in a costume shop, a woman walks in looking for a sort of medieval female costume and she is startled that a man works there she says something like a man working in ladies fashion um and then also when adam goes looking for barbara in the hospital uh, and that woman with the big glasses who you posted a picture of on our facebook page actually uh justin that woman says oh are you her boyfriend and he goes no no i'm just her co-worker so I'm wondering God, she if she's so hot, by the way. She's so hot. <laughs> Actually, did you notice that in that scene, Barbara looks exactly like Linda Carter in the guise of Diana Prince? Mm. No, mm. was it just me? <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I mean the film is is just absolutely bonkers. I like the way as well, you were mentioning the the magic act that is in the show at the start of the film. Um, did anyone, did anyone um, think of Kenneth Williams when a snake turned into a pearl necklace? <laughs> oh. Oh. I just thought the symbolism was, was, was there, you know? That was wonderful. No, I didn't pick up on that, and I'm, I'm very right. proud of you, Eric, for doing this. <laughs> yeah. Uh, um, as for background on the film, I mean, I have precious little, really, but apparently it was shot in 1979, according to the They Came From Within book which I, which is a study of canadian horror mm. um it was filmed in 1979 it obviously didn't get released then till 83 um, and it was filmed by uh, the director of photography was the same guy who did prom night his name is robert new uh, the film also went out under the titles warlock and body puzzle um it's one of only two films that the director Ota Richter made, uh, the other being a 1987 movie called Oklahoma Smugglers, which um, I hope makes a bit more sense than Skullduggery. Uh, the lead Let's actor cover that next time. Sorry? Let's cover that film next time. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure Nathan probably has it lined up for us. <laughs> yeah. The lead, actor, the lead actor, Tom Haverstock, um, who plays Adam, was also in Terror Train. Uh, you'll, he's very recognisable. He has the exact same haircut, which makes me think that it probably was filmed in 1979 because he looks identical to how he looks in Terror Train. Uh, I actually he got in Terror Train? I don't remember him in Terror Train. Um, he is in Terror Train. I can't remember the character name. I'll look it up in a second. But, his um, name is Bill, but I don't remember who that is in the movie. He's only a minor character in Ter yeah. Terror Train, but he is. if you saw Terror Train, you'd be able to spot him. You know. Um, 
I actually got in touch with him actually on Facebook. I was hoping to interview him, but he didn't want to be. He said that working on Skullduggery was one of the main reasons why he decided to quit acting, but he didn't elaborate on that. I mean, I wrote back to him saying, could you elaborate a little? And he never got back to me. So um, it can't have been a fun experience. Mm. Uh, Wendy Crewson, who plays Barbara, uh, she's uh, probably had the most successful career, it seems, of all the people involved in the film. She was in things like, she was in all the Santa Claus movies with Tim Allen. Um, she played Arnie's wife, if you have Arnie there ready to go with a soundbite, in the in the sixth day. Um, mm. And she was, she was no also Arnie in... This week, yeah. No Arnie this week? No, well. She's in what I'm not, lies I'm beneath. Not, I'm not near my computer, sorry. He okay. must be with his um, she's, in the, she's in the horror films. Sorry, Justin? He must be with his housemaid. Yeah. Ooh, yeah. controversial. Mm. giving her one I don't care there, I'll just do an Arnie for you <laughs> <laughs> right now I am thinking about another meeting in the <laughs> um, she also appeared in some horror films like What Lies Beneath and The Good Son and she's also in a movie called Boathouse which is also known as Who Done It. I don't know have you yes. guys ever heard heard yes, of that one I bought that once thinking it was the island uh, it was the Who Done It with um, yeah. know, Rick Dean the one we covered Cause, and it also had really good, you know, VHS artwork. I was like, ooh, this is neat. I'm going to get it. And I was like, this is a different movie. And it is boring. Mm-hmm. Oh, dear. It's well, she, worse she, than that Day of Judgment. And she actually also appears, coincidentally, in that Mazes and Monsters movie you were talking about, Justin, mm-hmm. with uh, Tom Hanks. And it also stars Clark Johnson, who is in Skullduggery as well. Uh, and speaking of Mazes and Monsters, it also stars David Wallace, who was the mop-topped hero from Mortuary and Humongous. Mm. Yeah. Mm. Uh, and Vera Miles is in there as well from The Initiation and Psycho. Mm. So uh, Mazes and Monsters might be one worth checking out, although it does have Tom Hanks and he has a tendency to make me feel sick. Um, is it a slasher movie? No, it's a, t- it's a made-for-TV movie about Dungeons and Dragons. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I'll pass. Well, there's yeah. a connection between um, Skullduggery and the Day of Judgment. Was there? Yes. Did you not know? Uh, We're covering that, both of them. Well, yeah. no, no, Skullduggery was filmed in Canada. Yes. And um, the Day of Judgment was filmed in the United States, and the United States is next to Canada. No way. Yes, Actually, the makes... United States is below Canada. That is, is spooky, it? Justin. Well done. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. That took me quite a while to dig that one up. Did it? Yeah. Okay. Well done. Thank you. Actually, um, we're, I'm connected to a day of judgment. Um, it was filmed in North Carolina, and I'm in Tennessee, and Tennessee is right next to North Carolina. Well, then it's I'm just, connected to it, too. Wow. Yes. So there you go. Mm. And I've been I, to North Carolina. So have I. So there. I have no interesting factoids, <laughs> I'm afraid. <laughs> <laughs> the final bit of background I have on the film is that Michael Tuff is in it as well. I think it's Tuff is how you pronounce his surname. It's T-O-U-G-H. Yes. Hmm. Uh, he plays Mike, who's the one who comes out with the lines like, I've got a raccoon in my pants. Would you like to set it free? Oh, is that him? Um, I didn't recognise him. Yeah, that's him. And, um, of course, he went on, well, he probably filmed this before Prom Night, but he went on to be the killer in Prom Night, uh, Jamie Lee Curtis's brother. <gasps> Spoiler. Spo- well, we spoiled it probably a long time ago, I think. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, that was him. And I, I'm, I don't think he appears in the rest of the movie except appearing in that scene dressed as a clown where he keeps going on about how he wants to suck a hose of a Greyhound bus or something. Mm, which is very suck bizarre. Suck a Greyhound through a hose. Doesn't make any sense, does it, at all? No. Um, like he says to, he says to a girl, why, do you want to see oh, why they call me oh. BJ? And I'm like, mm, <laughs> that can't be right. <laughs> no. <laughs> Well, it's kind of weird because I looked up at, um, at the variety uh, and I had a quick look to see um, uh, about this film because I, I put in the d- director's um, name. It was, it was Otto or Otto Richter or something, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah. Um, and it said that the f- it started filming on December the 6th, 1982, which oh, I thought okay. was strange. But it does look more... Sorry, I've got a cat. I've got a cat on my lap. Sorry, it's a different one. But I got um, one on my lap too. That's oh, have you? Oh, got it. Not what anymore. You, now she's chasing stuff. Okay. <laughs> um, but no, it was. Um, is he? Is he? Oh, oh, oh. But um, but yeah, but it was kind of. It said it was directed in on uh, December sixth, nineteen eighty two, when it started filming, and it's obviously filmed in the winter, wasn't it? You could tell it was all. It looked quite cold. Yeah. Um, obviously, it was Canada, but um, but uh, yeah, I don't know. It, it looked more like 1979 to me the fashions but 
I don't know. But having said that, all of that kind of makeup stuff looked a little bit more sort of maybe 1982. I don't know. Mm. Yeah. Mm. Mm. So, but then they came from within is a great little book. So, um, uh, you know, who knows? Who knows? Yes, who but, knows uh, indeed. Mm. Um, what else? Oh, yeah. Uh, like the ending of the film where he's at Dr. Evil's <laughs> mansion, which is called Villa Evil, of course. Yeah, of course. Um, that whole scene where he invites two women on stage and they go through a sort of a neon door frame and then there's a guy dressed as Robin Hood turns around and fires an invisible bow and arrow at the gesture doll. Mm. Anyone have any ideas? Anything? No. I've, no. I've got a confession, what? Eric. I didn't actually finish the movie. <gasps> I did. Well, I, do, I would have done, but I ran out of time. Um, so I didn't see that bit. I'm sorry. Oh, Justin. <laughs> you're supposed, supposed to be, be a professional. You're supposed to be professional. Okay, well, did you see the bit where um, Adam goes to the psychic and after yes, he stabbed her, he, mm. you hear this um, film playing in the background? Yes, where he says, and put your hands up. Yeah. If you yeah. Have, do you have that clip there? This is the film that's playing and the, the film within the film is just as bizarre as Skullduggery. So if you play the clip. Now turn around real slow. Tries to see me here? Oh, it's you, Frank. He's done it again, oh. Sheila. Where did he do it this time, Frank? In the bathroom, Sheila. Oh, good, Frank. Oh, God, this is hard, but he did it in the sink, Sheila. I see. Well, I must go now and clean my sink. Goodbye, Frank. Don't try to follow me. <laughs> Interestingly uh, enough, I think cleaning your sink would be more entertaining than this film. Did he have Argento? Oh, no, I think cleaning the sink would be more ent- ent- uh, enjoyable than Day of Judgment, but... Not, not just um, slightly uh, below Skullduggery. Mm. I think there's plenty to like in Skullduggery, even if you don't like it and Justin can't finish it. Uh, no, it's not. I couldn't finish it. It's just I, I ran out of time. <laughs> he wouldn't finish it. He refused because yeah. I had to watch uh, bloody sto- um, a Dave Judgment as well. So, um, so it's a double bill, well, and I got up two, late. Had two so. whole weeks. Yes. Okay. But, well, anyway, there's a scene at the end where. He's in Dr. Evil's lair and he's going to do some kind of stage show. And the stage show, he invites two women up on stage and they just walk through this neon door frame. Mm. And that's and that's the show. And right. I'm like... It sounds like okay. one of Toya's shows. Sorry? It sounds like one of Toya's. Oh, go away, you. <laughs> oh, I just oh. don't know what to make. I mean, I'm sure there's probably intellectuals out there who can analyse Skullduggery and tell us what it all means. Hmm. But... Uh, yeah, there's something to do with Adam and Eve. There's some, that that theme permeates throughout the film. So and the Punch the and Judy as well. The Punch mm? and Judy, the Punch yeah. and Judy doll. Because do you know what Punch and Judy is in in the states? Any? It's about yes. puppets, isn't it? That's the right. Yeah. They did a the segment in was it Scream Time? Yeah, that's yes. what I remember from. Yeah, no, yeah, the that's Punch right. and Judy dolls were the killers. Well, that's because it's the the punch doll with the kind of the the big chin and the, it's it's kind of it's dotted throughout the film, isn't it? Because it's in the hospital and also in the in the um, uh, big bit at the beginning in in Canterbury with this kind of bizarre looking punch doll in the um, in the supposedly medieval times. But uh, yeah, so I don't know what the the relevance of all that was. But uh, but I wonder if Otto Richter knew or they mm. put him away. Soon after, it feel, it, did you ever do that? Ex- put him away. Yeah. <laughs> did you ever do that um, creative writing exercise where somebody would write a couple of lines for a short story and then hide it, and then the next the person had to follow it on? Mm. It feels like a, sort of about seventy people sort of wrote a little bit, each wrote a little bit of the film, and then they just filmed the script that resulted. Because mm. it's just it's just absolutely all over the place. Um, although it's, it's like full. a bunch of monkeys sitting at typewriters working out exactly. something. Exactly. Yeah. Um, it was the best of movies. It was the blurst of movies. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, where else will you find a, a film that has lines like, could you please deflate your tits? <laughs> Anyone? No, it's probably it's quite a few films else. like that. So I guess all in all, I kind of like Skullduggery for mm. that particular fact. But man. Yeah. And also the What's scene it? where he he forces steam into the face of some woman and burns her down to just a skull. I mean, her entire skeleton even is burnt away. It's just he's just left holding a skull. Mm. Bizarre. See, but if the movie were more boring than what it was, don't you think my my name my title is in, is clever? Dull Skuggery. Very clever. Very clever. Yes. 
Very clever. Or well done. Who was who equipped that Rob Zombie would make it a remake? Skullfuckery. Skullfuckery. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that would be about right. Yeah. Somebody on the forums on the yeah yes. forums. Mm. And does anyone can anyone decipher what the story is with that janitor who walks around with the knots and crosses board in his back? Isn't that tic tac toe? Well, tic tac toe. Yeah, we call it knots yes. and crosses. Oh, okay. All right. Anyone know what his significance is? Maybe it's it's an in joke or something. Yeah, it doesn't have to be any significance. No, nothing makes sense. So just just go with mm. it. Yeah, and why does Barbara have a rash that they keep referring to, and she keeps scratching her thigh? Yeah. Why can't I get no tang around here? <laughs> <laughs> I don't understand this film. I just don't understand. Mm. Yeah, it's like the naked lunch of slasher movies. It is. Everyone's it always is. talking about skullduggery, 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 skullduggery. That's hard to say three times fast. <laughs> it is. Okay, well, do we do we all would we all recommend at least one viewing for Skullduggery to newbies? Yes. Well, yes, Justin. as long as you're not expecting a slash movie, because it is a yeah. it is a slash movie in so much there are murders, um, and there are murders with different implements like meat cleavers, knives, swords, all various different things, isn't it? But mm. it's kind of they're, they're almost cursory, aren't they? I kind of guess they're not really. Uh, well, I mean, they are central to the progression to the story uh, in so much that the, uh, you know, I kind of guess the main character is kind of killing them to be part of the game. But he's possessed, isn't he, by the curse from yeah. his ancestors, blah, blah, blah. That's blah, about, blah, that's blah, about blah. all of the plot I could decipher. <laughs> <laughs> yes, but it's not it's not in any way, shape or form a really um, a kind of a slash movie as you know it, really, is it? But I think no. it's worth watching. It's worth watching once just because... It's, you know, get loaded and watch this movie. Well, you'll like never see anything else quite like it, I have to say. Makes, exactly, yeah. yes. Mm. Yeah. Okay, so I think that's it. for Unless you guys have any um, further background information on Skullduggery. No. Nope. Um, I do like the, um, the I think it's Media VHS release, the artwork with them on the chessboard. Yeah, it, lo- it looks slightly oh, cheap, it, but I do like that. it, I have to say, yeah. Yeah, I want to mention that, but that's mm. all I can think of i wonder if it did it. um get any kind of release again it's another one of those films i that... i looked it up on the bbfc and it hasn't got any they don't have any record of a film called skullduggery on their list so i don't know if it got released over here do you own it on vhs justin i don't actually i don't know if it ah. got any release here i mean i i think baby jesus helped me out on that score he helped um, me yeah, out big I had time to, it, yeah mm. had to but, consult with him but he obviously, he obviously got released in the states didn't it on media but yeah, um that, and I have just after uh, Mary Magdalene deflated her tits. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you're going to be struck by lightning. Uh, I also have one, uh, uh, the same video cover, but on a different label here called Video Treasures. I don't know if that's American or yeah. They did the exact same. Yeah, Video Treasures. They 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 released the exact same artwork as the media. They basically yeah. are the same company, but they do like the what is it the the EP or. Um, the, the Video Treasures one has a date in 1990 on it, so, and the Media yeah. one has 1984. They're just, so they're just lower all VHS releases. For, oh, right. Yeah. Mm. Okay, well. Yeah, but Anything okay, else? so overall for me, it's a minor thumbs up for Skullduggery and a thumbs down for Day of Judgment. Okay. I would yeah. agree. Yeah. yeah, no, fair enough. What about you, Nathan? Well, I can't give thumbs down to either one of them because I really feel that Day of Judgment, they had their hearts in the right place. And Skullduggery is just, you know, it's um, so nonsensical, it's entertaining. Hmm. Okay. I should well, interject here and say that maybe we ought to change our ratings because uh, Roger Ebert did copyright the thumbs up, thumbs down thing. So we could okay. get sued. Could we? No. So uh, dick, dick down for Day of Judgment, <laughs> dick up for Skullduggery. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, what I think the porn enough. industry might have did copyright that too. Okay, so. what can we do then? No, I think we Would should. Would you like it or not? One. I think. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, I somewhat liked yes. Skullduggery. I didn't care for a Day of Judgment, so there. Right. Okay. <clears throat> Fair enough. Yeah. Well, I think what's this? What, oh, what's I've just, rolled, I've just rolled a, a 12, which means. What does that mean? I'm, I'm the king of everything and you've got to worship me. Okay. You have to listen to Toya all for the rest of the day. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, that's not going to happen. Um, shall we? Um, well, thank you, Eric, for those two. Um, shall we move on to feedback? 
Yes. Yes. Should yes. we move? Should we play? Um, Joseph's recorded a new contact details. So Again. if you want to contact With the music show, this time, indeed, here it is. Be sure to search for and like us on Facebook. Follow us on Twitter at THC underscore podcast. Our voicemail is 858-233-9281. And you can email us directly at the.hysteria.continues at gmail.com. Thank you, Joseph. Yes, the Halloween okay. music. I yes. had to add that. Yeah, very good. It gives it a little yeah. oomph, don't you think? Yes, yes. absolutely. Yes. God, I can smell... A cat has done something around here. I'm not sure what it is. <laughs> it's, uh, God. God. I can smell a well... Uh, some kind of wet cat thing. Mm. It's kind of like... It's it's not good. But anyway, I'll ignore it. And let's just push <laughs> on like as professional as we are. Ew. Sorry? Ew. I'm going to be sick. <laughs> let's just push on. Come on. Eight, so yeah, you're going to be... Push on. Your stomach. Yeah, I know. Mm. I'll have to light a joystick. Um... Right, okay. Who I wants to go to f- one thing, Justin, mm. now that you're talking about wet cats, when we first start when I moved down here to record to be near the the um uh, the Wi Fi, <clears throat> one of the cats made a mess and I had to mop it up while we were recording. So you didn't hear it because I had it on mute. But that happened. Really? Oh, then you weren't paying attention. I was mopping a cat here during mm-hmm. this show. This show? Gosh. Yes. Well, that goes to show what professionals we are at here at the Hysteria Continues. There's anything they throw at you. Cat piss, mm. Toya, everything we can cope with. <laughs> hey! What? You're just being utterly mean now. Oh, come on, Eric. Yeah, well, a day of judgment style retribution is going to be coming your way soon. Oh, is it? Well, yeah. It can put me to sleep. Um, <laughs> right, <Yep>. okay. Well, <laughs> what shall we push on for yep. yes. um, the feedback? So, who would like to go first? I'll go first. Okay, Nathan, take it away. Okay, these are all Facebook feedbacks. Is, um, the first one is from Kelly Briars McQueen, and this is regarding Day of Judgment. What an odd movie. It's not even really a slasher or even a supernatural slasher, as with that ending, how could it be? But I guess the same could be said about April Fool's Day, and that's still a slasher in my eyes. It's horribly made, and the pacing is ridiculously awful, yet I couldn't stop watching it. Anyway, rambling to myself here, looking forward to the episode. So I hope you enjoyed it, Kelly. Um, Indeed. And it's not Kelly, is it? It's um, that's, uh, And I can never remember his name, but he's using his wife's oh. Facebook account. But um, oh. husband of Kelly, thank you for that oh, feedback. Okay. Well, when Eric sent it to me, that's the only name I saw. So Yeah, no, no, it's fine. It's, it's a bit... Um, oh. After that, it's uh, Jean Sebi? Sebi? I think, oh. I, think he, I think he's Jean, because I think he's French. Oh, okay. Jean. Yeah. Yeah, oh, okay. I, th- I think so anyway, yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, it's okay, as was Skullduggery, even if Skullduggery is more fun. I guess uh, people unforgiving on religious matters will hate it for its views. Still, it was decent, I think. I was expecting utter shite from all the bad reviews and got TV movie quality out of it. And I said shite because he put an E at the end, so I assume that's what it meant. That is correct. That is correct, yeah. yes. But it's kind of a very um, br- British way of saying shit. Yes. Oh, great. Or Irish as well. Yeah. So, mm-hmm. do you guys usually say shit or shite? Which one do y'all say more? I'd say shite more. I think. Yeah, I say shite more. More. Oh, okay. I'm gonna start saying that. Um, I like that word better. I think. <laughs> um, Brandon Miller said, "I like Doodles the Goat." That's it. <laughs> so, thanks, Brandon. <laughs> yeah, well, it's exactly. I think um, Jean makes a good point. It is like that. It is a bit like a TV movie, isn't it? Oh yeah, it very much is, so. Yeah. Yeah. You could imagine like um, any of any of the Waltons family to wander in any moment. Mm. Mm. Uh, lastly, from Josh Gratton, aka Body Boy on the message boards. Um, neither Skullduggery or Day of Judgment are that awful when compared to some others that I've seen. I can actually say that I enjoyed Skullduggery and that Judgment's Judgment's budget was somewhat admirable. The old lady kids uh, graveyard sequence was great downhill from there but the scythe decapitation was pretty awesome in a battle of favorites i'd pick skullduggery but judgment's video art is pretty good i agree with that yeah no fair enough yeah. josh mm-hmm. yeah you. i'd agree with that too Ooh, okay because the the, oh, yeah. US, the u.s video art is the it's kind of the silhouette of the scythe wielding wielding killer in what looks like he's walking through a sort of sea of cloud or mist mm. 
and it's quite eerie and effective, whereas the Stormbringer one from the UK is a bit cheaper looking. It's got the size wielding killer, but done much more flatly. I don't know, how would you describe it, Justin? It's, it's kind of um, cartoonish, is it? Yeah, it kind of looks... I'm trying to work out who it looks like. It's not Michael Jackson. It's um, <laughs> like Michael Berryman, maybe. I don't know. It's kind yeah, of like... Yeah. It's like... Or Morph. Do you remember Morph? Mm. Mm. Well, no, well, I suppose... Yeah, I do remember Morph. It does translate, but... Um, it, it doesn't have a huge amount of detail, is probably what <coughs> the yeah. problem with it is. Yeah. It looks like it was drawn by a 14-year-old girl yeah. for an art project. Yeah, although she hasn't put a smiley face above the eye in Stormbringer. No. <laughs> yeah. Well, no, thank you, Nathan, for reading those out. Who would mm-hmm. um, who would like to go next? We've actually got a voicemail to get onto as well at some point. Okay, so, I'll go next then. Yes. I've got one here from our friend Reese Donnell, who lives up in Derry. Which hey, is the, Yeah, which is the wonderful city that gave us Nadine from Girls Aloud. Mm. There you go. So anyway, hey guys, Reese here again, just dropping by a line to say your recent shows have been absolutely incredible. You guys just keep getting better and better. I'd like to extend a personal thanks to Nathan in particular for opening up my mind to a whole series of gems, in inverted commas I would put, um, such as Movie House, Mass- Movie House Massacre, The Last Slumber Party, House of Death, Terror at Red Wolf Inn and Wood Chipper Massacre, all of which I promptly bought. I must say the double feature you guys did on Halloween and Halloween 2 was awesome. Kudos to you all for tackling two of the huge slasher classics so effortless, so, effort, uh, so effortlessly and still remaining hilarious and informative. I'm absolutely dying to hear you guys cover the likes of Honeymoon Horror, Unhinged, X-Ray and my personal favourite Holy Grail slasher, Satan's Blade. I don't know why, but I'm looking at Nathan to pick one of one or all of those. <laughs> Wink. I wonder why. Yeah, I know. Keep up the incredible work and you're still awesome Facebook friends. Bloody regards, Reese Donnell. Oh, thank you, Reese. Oh, you sorry, there's a Reece. PS as well. Yeah. P.S. Eric, I haven't gotten my picture taken in front of the Muff Divers Club just yet, but I was in that neck of the woods recently and saw a poster that proclaimed the Muff Clipper Festival 2013. We hope to see you there. I do not <laughs> lie. Ooh, er, misses. Okay, well, well, Muff is the name of a coastal town up in County Donegal believe it or not, and they have a Muff Divers Club and they also have a Muff Clipper Festival. A Clipper, <laughs> a clipper being a type of boat. Mm. Yes. I can, yes. The, 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 um, the double entendres are a possibility to endless, aren't they? I know, in completely. Muff. Imagine living in the town of Muff. Um, yeah, so, Nathan, you got a nice shout out there for introducing him to gems like Movie House Massacre, Last Slumber <laughs> Party, House of Death, Terror at Red Wolf Inn and uh, Woodchipper Massacre. I'm not familiar with that one. Oh, yes, it's awesome. Uh, that's not one I've of you, chatted with Reese um, often on it's Facebook. It's more of a comedy. So I've told it's him not, a lot It's not one of Nathan's it. films, is it? Well, no, no, it's, no. Uh, it's actually kind a movie. Of. But it's, right. it's actually more of like a dark comedy than a, than a slasher movie, but it's, it's really good. I think John McBride, the, the guy who made it, he doesn't have the money, but he has the talent, in my opinion. Hmm. What, what era is it from? Is it from eight, the, the 80s? 80s. Yeah, right. yeah, it's late 80s. It's shot on video, isn't it? Yeah, it is. Yeah. yeah, well, I have a newfound respect for shot on video since watching Burning Moon on this big screen. And Cannibal Campout is uh, amazing. Oh, I love Cannibal Campout. He also mentions he wants us to cover, if possible, uh, Honeymoon Horror, Unhinged, X-Ray, and <laughs> Satan's Blade. Now, I know one of them has been discussed in the past, but I want sure to we'll say... we'll get around to all of them, won't we, at some point? Sure we will, be yeah. a lot of fun. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I have seen... All of them except Unhinged, I have to say. So, I've yet to watch that masterpiece. Oh, you must watch it then. I guess I'm going to have to pick it very soon. <gasps> okay. Okay, anyone else have um, feedback? Yeah, I have a couple here. I'll go ahead and read yeah. one out. This is from Kieran Edwards. I think I'm pronouncing that right, but he's better known as Cabe Gaplin on the forums. And he says, It's been a while since I've given you feedback in my own special way, so instead I thought I'd write you an email praising your continued excellence. All of your podcasts are excellent, which is maybe why there are periods where you don't get tons of feedback. Face it, we're, we're spoiled. Even if a podcast is littered with cat presence, he put littered in uh, quotations there, you manage to roll in it, I mean with it. What I'm trying to say is I'm always entertained by what goes on over the Hysteria podcast waves. Your Halloween, Halloween 2 podcast was stellar. I still enjoy both movies greatly, 
and in spite of the number of times I've seen them, you still manage to point out some stuff to me that I hadn't noticed. I'm glad you pointed out the James Inser poster in Halloween. He's my favorite tortured artist who lived with his parents. He's also the subject of a great They Might Be Giants song. I love They Might Be Giants, by the way. Uh, after I rewatched Halloween 2 and noticed who played Nurse Alv- Alves, Alves, I can't remember, Alves. I thought to myself, Alves. yeah, I thought to myself, well, isn't that ironic? The woman who sang I Will Survive couldn't survive Michael Myers. Then I realized I was confusing her with Gloria Gaynor. <laughs> <laughs> I also wanted to comment to commend your Movie House Massacre podcast and the wonderful interview Nathan conducted with Rick Sloan. Now all I need is for Nathan to start up his podcast again and I'll be a happier man. I also wanted to commend Eric for soldiering on in spite of the tragic news about Bob Hoskins, and that oh. is that Bob Hoskins is mm-hmm. retiring. I only wish I was friends with him so I could get him to, I don't know, send you a personalized video talking about how delicious a chunky Kit Kat is. <laughs> Lastly, I want to thank Justin and Joseph for keeping their respective sites up all of these years. And ironically, mine's down right now because I forgot to pay the bill, but it will be up later today. Ha, ha, ha. Uh, I hope you don't think I'm full of sugar when I say this, but these sites mean a great deal to me and provide comfort to my slasher laden soul. Keep up the great work, and I'll try and give you a ring in the future. Ha, 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 ha. That's like from the, Kate Gatlin. I like, I like the full of sugar. So did I. I was going to say I like oh, the full yeah. of sugar <laughs> reference, which is a reference to the TV version of Halloween 2. Yeah, yeah I think yeah. Um, Cape deserves one of these, isn't it? Matron, take them away! But Cabe has a PS here. It says, PS, regarding Toya versus Susie, they both don't hold a candle to Cindy Lauper. USA, (gasps) USA. I love you, Cabe. Oh. Oh, Thank you for being honest. That's like the first bout of honesty regarding these singers that I've ever heard. Finally, myself and Justin are united now. We're we're going to battle against. I mean, Cindy Lauper's not you know nice enough, but she just seems like a kind of simple lass who got trapped in a a hair dye factory over the weekend, (laughs) and then took some helium. That's all Mm. I'm going to say on the matter. Mm. Oh, I mean, uh, anything you say about her doesn't hurt me any. Doesn't it? Why not? Ooh. I don't know. I don't think I'm like the. I don't think I'm like a, a super fan like you guys are of Toya and Susie. Mm. I mean, you know, uh, and I don't feel I have to badmouth Toya or Susie because I feel you know life already does it for me. Oh, <laughs> oh. Nathan! I thought we could rely on you to be the voice yeah. of reason. <laughs> yeah. But I'm, I'm every once in a while, I I need to get some kind of good insult in. I can't, you know, <laughs> never. Um, you know, insult anybody. <laughs> that was a double negative. I apologize. I can't well, not never. Yes. That's a triple negative, is it? Yeah. <laughs> Let's make it a quadruple and go for a trifecta. Okay, I take double. it back. I think all three are beautiful, talented females. Well, thank you for yeah. leaving it on that positive point. It's mm-hmm. not true in th- two of the cases. But, um, <laughs> but um, should we move on to who's... Who's next? Has anyone else got you, any feedback? It's you, Justin. Do you have anything, Me? Justin? Okay, well, I'll leave the voicemail for last. Um, okay. We have a uh, Facebook um, message, we, we private message we got from Corey Hall. Um, and it's quite, a, it's quite a long one. So <laughs> I shall start. Um, hey, guys. First time writing in, but I've been a listener for about six months. And I listen to every episode. So thank you, Corey. Originally found your podcast while looking for a placement for a, another popular horror podcast that's gone on a very extensive hiatus. I'm sure you know the one. Do we know the one? Are we? Would that be? I think. Mondo I think movie? it's one that's just come back from its extended hiatus. Is it Mondo Movie? It could be Mondo Movie. Yes. If they're um, just. Back I don't know. I've never listened. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, it's a very good podcast. Yes. Mm. Not as good as ours, but um, actually, it's probably much more professional. Although I know they did record a whole episode. And then at the end of it, realised they hadn't recorded anything, just like this episode. Potentially, we'll find out. <laughs> <laughs> that would be awful. <laughs> I'm not re-recording Could you this imagine? episode. I know, I know. Um, you have to watch the films again. Okay. Mm. Anyway, sorry, Corey. Um, I was originally a little concerned with the four-host format. Thought it'd be people talking over each other all the time. 
which it is sometimes, but not too much. Um, but you guys handle it very well. <laughs> Thank mm-hmm. you. Sorry. But uh, plus I get two voices from the British Isles. W- would you agree with that, Eric? Uh, yeah, I think Ireland is part of the British Isles, even though we're okay. not part of Br- Britain. Yeah. Fair enough. Okay. It's um, like British Isles, love. You're late, but you'll get there. <laughs> And he says, without delving into political correctness or the morality, sorry, morality of the issue, one thing due to the ahem orientation of three of you guys, you don't really discuss except in passing, is the female nudity. I know half the reason I watched these movies as a young boy was the hot nude women. Um, uh, I don't expect, nor do I want you to start covering this aspect, but I just wanted to point out the exploitation of women was, is a major part of slasher movies. Did any of you have the hots for a slasher cast member, uh, member, uh, so member, member, when you were young? Um, <laughs> Eric, did you ever have the hots for a member? Oh, I did. Yes, many um, any times. Any particular one? Uh, a slasher cast member, John, mm. John Donovan. Uh, yes, and um, Paul Smith from Keeper. Pieces. Okay. And before he goes to the toilet, um, Harold in Friday the Thirteenth Part Three. But once oh he's on the toilet, when it, once he's on the toilet, no thanks. <laughs> How about you, Joseph? <laughs> yeah, um, I like Darcy DeMoss in Friday the 13th Part 6, and I liked, um, uh, I actually really liked Amy Steele a lot in Friday the 13th Part 2. And I liked uh, Laura Marie Taylor in Friday the 13th Part 2. Do you like Harold in Part 3? Yes. Oh, he likes sense. Billy in Part 5. I love Billy. I'd 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 have sex with Billy mm-hmm. right now. Interesting. Interesting. Yeah. What What about you, Nathan? Oh, yeah, too many to count. Um, I liked Mark, the wheelchair guy from uh, Part Two, Friday the Thirteenth. Oh, and Ramona um, from House of Death. Sorry. Oh yeah, yeah. I know you all. You really liked her. Um, but yeah, definitely. Uh, you know, Mark from uh, Part Two, and you know, I think. Um, the guy that plays the obnoxious guy in Part 5, Eddie, I always thought he was really cute, too. But, I mean, I know there's a lot more, but, like, you know, it's one of those situations where the questions I asked in my mind is blank. Mm, mm. Well, I was trying to think off the top of my head. I kind of like um, uh, Kevin Spiritas from Friday the 13th Part 7. Oh, yeah. Nice I forgot too. about him. Yeah. And um, Donovan Leach from um, Cutting Class. Hmm. Even with his crew cut? Interesting. Even his crew cut. No, he looks better. It looked better in the Blob remake, but then he gets um, he gets pulled off mm-hmm. far too early in that one. <laughs> See, I think Justin and I. <laughs> Sorry. I think Justin and I have similar tastes. Eric is on the other end of the spectrum. Mm. Oh yes. Different tastes. Yeah. Mm-hmm. <laughs> oh yes. Oh, and um, Tom Matthews from Flight Thirteen Part Six. Oh, definitely. Yeah. So <clears throat> well, there you go. There's just a few of them. But going back to Corey. We could actually do a, t- a, a top three hottest slash Ooh, movie kind of fun. members. I think I've just um, given away my, my members. Yes, but really? we could talk about them a bit more. Um, yeah, you detail, can go but, more in um, depth. Yes. But Corey goes on to say... If you want to see my member, go to www.smallcocks.com. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. hey. Eric, Eric. You, sorry, sorry. It was just set up for You need to eat life. something. You, you, I don't were, like you, were, you were set up for that one. <laughs> that was a good insult. Yeah. I'm, I'm sorry, I'm Joseph. Impressed. I'm sorry. Mm. Yes. Okay. And what was that URL one more time, Eric? <laughs> <laughs> Eric needs to eat something dot com. I am painfully okay. thin, I'm wasting away. <laughs> okay, well let's He's uh, lost like sixty pounds recording this episode. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Haven't we all? Um He's a right. wife now. <laughs> yeah. Corey goes on to say mine was and I think this is probably shared by a lot of people, was Chris Kirsten Baker from Friday, Friday the thirteenth, part two says, I was about nine when I saw her and I believe she kick-started puberty for me. One more thing, love the Halloween, Halloween 2 episode, but you guys are crazy for thinking that shitty over-simped score to Halloween 2 is better than the original. Go on, Eric. You want to that? Uh, No, I don't agree. I I still Mm. think Halloween 2 score is far superior. Now, don't forget that I saw Halloween 2 before Halloween 1, so maybe that might have had an influence on it. I agree with... I agree. I agree with (laughs) Eric. (laughs) Oh, Nathan, you're so gay if you a glee something, aren't you? <laughs> so gay. Yeah. Nathan watches glee. Do you, Nathan? No, Wes really likes glee, so I've seen it, you know. Okay. Okay. Well, right. Right. Well, we won't we won't uh, condemn you for that or because I've seen a f- I've seen some glee episodes, but not very many. But um but Corey goes on to say, um 
he talks about the score. He goes on to say it's the simplicity that makes it so perfect. Also, you didn't mention any of the sequels in depth, which the reason for that is we'll probably get on to them at some point, is what do you all think of H2O? Um, if you watch the original two and H2O back-to-back, that makes a great trilogy, albeit with a weaker final third. Have any of you watched it this way? Sorry about the long post, just been saving it up, I guess. Thanks for all you do, and keep up the good work. Corey from Colorado. So, thank you, Corey. Um... Yeah, I think it's a very valid remark, isn't it? Halloween um, H2O is, I kind of guess, is the natural successor, isn't it, to Halloween 2? Because it, yeah. it was done as if Halloween 4 or 5 never happened, I can, I can guess. Um, and 6. And 6, That's yes, of course. Cool. Yeah. Yeah. I, um, uh, I haven't watched H2O for a long time, <laughs> but I did really love it. I think I've said before on the podcast, myself and my friend Kevin went to see it in the cinema when it, on the day it opened, and we went straight back in and watched it a second time afterwards. You know, we went straight out of the cinema back into the queue to buy another ticket. Um, oh, that just, was, that's just the only there. time I've ever done that for a film. Mm, okay. Uh, mm. But I think it's, it's so short. I think it's, it's, it's slightly less than 80 minutes long. So um, I, I just thought I find it really effective. I thought it was one of my favourites of those late 90s slashers. Mm. Mm. Yeah, I agree with Eric. Yeah, no, I'd, I'd like I to agree. watch it again soon. But. <laughs> <laughs> I don't remember much about it. I saw it at the theatre and that was the last time I saw it. Fair enough, fair enough. Okay, right. Well, well, what, did you, what did you think, Justin, you didn't say about h No, I liked it. I liked it. I mean, I, I remember getting the goose pimples, um, goosebumps or whatever, when we were watching it and the um, she turns and then the music starts and she's got the axe and she walks off and I thought that was, you know, I th- thought it was pretty good um, considering um, yeah. that it was done as a, a kind of a scream you know, sort of inspired sort of movie. Um, and I, yeah, and I thought it was pretty good. Yeah, but uh, yes. Well, I've never, I've never, sorry, I've never sat down and watched one, two, and H two O back to back though. No, no I haven't. Interesting, either. interesting way to look at it. But uh, yeah, yeah. Okay, do we have anything else before we do the final voicemail? I have, I have another, one more. What about you, Eric? I have one more as well, and this okay. is from the Facebook page for Hysteria Continues because I mentioned in a post that I'd been to see Halloween. Uh, the first Halloween, 1978's one, in the cinema. And I was asking mm. people for, for their experiences of going to see it now. So uh, James McCormick said that it happens a lot with films from our past, especially when the youth see them now. I mean, I'm 32 years old and hold Halloween in such high regard. I watch it a few times a year to remind me a film can be that good and eerie. Same thing happened to a retro screening of Total Recall recently. It, it's become a comedy now, not the action sci-fi film I grew up with, a huge grin during. But the funny thing is, it happens, it works as a comedy now. I've noticed horror never ages well with a young crowd. They tend to scoff at what creeped the hell out of us, but it is generational. Yet something like M, I don't know what that means, sorry, will send it's chills. It's it's like, oh, sorry, yes, of yeah. course. Yeah, because yeah, he says that, yeah. Something like M will still send chills up my spine, and that's 80 years old. Sorry, I thought M was just an acronym for something I'd missed. Uh, Amanda Reyes, Amanda by Night. Uh, chimes in then with sa- says, I saw Halloween last week and thought the audience was pretty game, although there was laughing in those places you mentioned with Annie and Laurie. Um, the bit with Annie, of course, is where she dies. And she, she, her, her, she goes boss-eyed. And the, the Laurie bit, I can't remember which bit was the one they laughed at. Um, the best part, though, was that a guy brought his friend who had never seen it, and I heard him ask her what she thought, and she said, that was really good. So uh, obviously some people are warming to it even 34 years later. My, my my experience when I went to the cinema was I got the feeling that some people were a bit unenthused. I mean, there was no talking in that during, during the film, but there was no... Um, they, I, it didn't feel like a sort of communal horror experience like I had in the horror but that might have been because the, the soundtrack was so low. Um, Joseph Iniguez, is that how you pronounce it? Y-N-I-G-U-E-Z? Iniguez. Anyone help me out with the pronunciation? I have no Sorry. idea. Okay. Well, he saw it in the theatres back in 2006 and the audience totally ate it up. They even cheered and clapped at the end. And you could tell some hadn't seen it, but all audible responses were positive and even enhanced the experience. I'd seen it so many times before that, but seeing it on the big screen makes it way more suspenseful and even a little scary. I can't wait to see it again tomorrow night, which 
you know, has passed now. So I hope you enjoyed it, Joseph. Chris Butler then said, I was able to finally see an actual film print a few years back at Lincoln Centre and it was great. Those scenes with Michael behind the bush in the background, etc., are a lot spookier on the big screen. Of course, it was marred slightly by the too cool for school hipsters who had to laugh at the silly old movie. They weren't laughing when there's a great jump scare when the wind... They weren't laughing when there's that great jump scare when the window crashes at the Myers house with Loomis and the sheriff there. Tons of the same people screamed and jumped. Uh, then Sick Chick, I think is how it's pronounced. Or it could be Psych Chick because it's spelt S-I-K-E. She said, saw it, loved it. Checked my closets and under my bed when I got home. Not kidding. It, it was a Blu-ray projection and the sound was a little wonky like some of it was a bad dub. The crowd was a mixed bag of youngish folks, 20-somethings and up, and oldsters, the over-40 set, me included. Uh, there were some laughs, especially at Linda's totallys, but no chatting. I even saw a few of the kids jump a few times. The weirdest thing was they announced they were going to show a 10-minute doc on the making of the movie beforehand. Instead, the movie just started, which was fine by me because I got home at 11, just in time for bed. Overall, it was fun, and I'm really glad I finally got to see it in the theatre, even if it was totally a Blu-ray projection. Uh, and then finally, Magigreen Ozu, which I don't know if that's a real name or an assumed name. He's uh, or she's, I'm not quite sure. Sorry, Magigreen. Uh, saw it here in, the Dar- in Derby in the UK. Uh, looked like a Blu-ray projection to me too. And yes, the sound did go wonky for a few seconds. And the soundtrack problems were there too, with the dialogue being lower than normal, which is exactly the experience I had actually when I saw it. Uh, the day before Halloween, I noticed that the the dialogue seemed lower than the, the background soundtrack, which is kind of odd. Uh, anyway, he goes on to say, smallish crowd due to it being the earlier screening, and despite some flaws, it was great to finally see Halloween in the cinema. So there we go. Uh, m- mostly positive. Mostly yes, positive, positive for people who's... Yeah. Mm-hmm. Excellent. You had right, to your breath you. on that one, Eric? Yeah. <laughs> hmm. 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 Joseph has another one. Okay. Yeah, one more. Um, this is more Halloween related stuff. This is from Jake McCoy. He says, Hello, boys. Jake the Snake here to comment on the Halloween show. I mean, I don't think there's anything that can be said about Halloween that hasn't been said. Great atmospheric thriller. Needs to be watched every year around this time. Now, Halloween 2, it does its job as a sequel, continues the story and amps up the violence. And I do have to confess, I do enjoy the other sequels as well. Even though Michael's masks in 4 and 5 are ugly as hell, I swear in one scene in part 4, the mask makes him look sad. And the later ones get real ridiculous with the cult plot and Michael facing off against Buster Rhymes. But I think I've expressed this in an earlier email that I enjoy any movie that takes place during Halloween time, no matter how crappy. And yes, even Rob Zombie's movies. Now, I'd like to talk about my experience seeing Halloween on the big screen. I went last Thursday to see this blasting Blue Oyster Cult's Don't Fear the Reaper to set the mood and blasting Mr. Sandman on the way back. I was really excited to catch one of the best horror movies, and when the opening credits started and the main theme came on, I got the major chills. However, the theater experience wasn't that great. The crowd was pretty small and really non-responsive, except one point when Michael slowly rises behind Lori, matron please, which is one of the creepiest scenes in the movie, but these two jackasses in the audience thought it was the funniest thing ever. So while the experience could have been better, overall seeing one of the best horror movies on the big screen is pretty much the highlight of this Halloween. So by the time you read this, it will be past the holiday. So I hope you all have had a great Halloween. P.S. Something I keep forgetting to mention in my last few emails. I am Team Susie. Sorry, Eric. And that's from (gasps) Jake McCoy. Oh, thank you, Jake. I have a feeling that's not the last we hear from Team Susie either. Oh, really? (laughs) Yes. Um, Let's go on to um, that voicemail then, shall we, Eric? Yes. Yes. Mm. Hi, guys. This is Brett Roberts. I've written to you before, but um, I thought I would leave a voicemail and ask uh, some questions for your next show so you can all hear what I sound like. Um, Okay, first question. Um, What do you guys think about Texas Chainsaw Massacre Part 2 from 1986? Because I've always thought it was better than the first one. And I like the 80s better than the 70s. And I like the effects. And I like Dennis Hopper. And I like Caroline Williams. She's good. I think it's an underrated movie. It's just supposed to be funny, good fun, and that's what it is. And I, I think the first one's good, but I don't like it as much as the second one. 
and the rest are terrible. But what do you guys think? Okay, so there's one, there's one. And then, um, hmm, maybe I should have thought of these questions before I wrote in. Oh, okay, here's one. Who was your favorite character on Dallas? Who was your favorite character on Knott's Landing? And I think that ought to do it. That's my voice message. I, I hope to hear it on your next show. Oh, and one last thing. I'll just leave it at this. Here we go. Did anyone work out what song that is? No. I have no idea. I don't know. I just said when I sent that to you that that sounds about right for a Susie song. Oh. It's all, you know, I can't tell what distorted. that is. Sounds like crap because, you know, Susie's terrible. Joseph, you have to every... explain the joke. It's not as funny. <laughs> I know. I have to explain the joke to you. I know every Susie song. I'm like... Does this keep going? We monitor. <laughs> it's about another 10 seconds, but I'm trying to work out. Oh, here you go. That was Susie. Susie's better than Toya. Okay. Boo! Bye-bye. Boo! <laughs> Yay! Um, yeah. um, Even the distorted mess is better than Toya. <laughs> no, it's I still couldn't work out. You have to write back in, Brett, and tell us what that was, because even I couldn't work out what that was. But I agree 100% with your sentiment. In fact, it seems like it's a complete walkover this episode for Susie. So wouldn't you agree? Eric. No. And especially on the 30th <laughs> Susie always wins. Eric, Eric can't win. It's my episode. On the 30th anniversary wins. of um, the classic um, release, uh, as you you said yourself, you posted on my Facebook page, Eric, yeah. that it's the 30th anniversary of the release of Kiss and the Dream House, perhaps the Susie's finest album. Um, what could be a better time for Susie to be triumphant over the ginger gonk? <laughs> I'm not having any of this. It's my episode. It's my episode. <laughs> um, is this your is this your kind of um, Inga moment? Yes, it is your my magic Inga moment. moment. You are the Inga of the podcast. <laughs> yes. I'm sorry, Eric. I'm sorry, but we should go back to Brett's questions. Um, yes. Uh, no, firstly. we should not. Oh, now not. now we've upset Nathan as well. What about? I'm not um, even going to dignify the first question with a response. Oh, I don't know. I've done forgot. What was the first question? It was. You think of is TCM Texas two? Chainsaw Massacre two better oh, yeah. than one? Um, I would say Dallas no. Dallas characters. I don't. I don't remember Dallas. I mean, I remember it, but I don't really remember all the characters. I guess Jr. Oh, the, the first question was Texas Chainsaw Massacre two. Yes. Yes. I would say. I would say it's not as good, but I enjoy Texas Chainsaw Massacre too. But I don't. I, I don't really enjoy it as much. Mm. Mm. I don't really enjoy it. I think it's loud and obnoxious, and I prefer the first one miles and miles more. And we know you're an Uber fan, Nathan. So you still going to are you still going to be keep mum on the subject or do you, do you like part two at all, Nathan? Uh, yes, of course. I, love, I love every Texas Chainsaw Massacre film in the original series, not the remakes. But part one is the best movie ever made, and that's all I have to say. Okay. Well, <laughs> off one controversial subject onto another. Who was your favorite, no, we, not we make... or Dallas? Yeah, character. Well, I, di- I didn't watch um, Dallas. But I, I didn't did either. Watch... I did watch. Well, I Landing. did, but I don't remember a whole lot, so I'm just going with the standard Jr. No, my favourite from Not Standing is Valine, played by Joan Van Ark, who was also in Frogs. My favourite oh. is Abby, played by Donna Mills. Oh. Yeah, I like her. Well, I kind of trying to think, because I kind of, I didn't see, I saw Not Standing back in the day, so I don't really remember it that well, but it would either be Valine or the Donna Mills character as well. But my fam- favourite Dallas character would probably be um, either Sue Ellen or Charlene Tilton, the Poison Dwarf, or <laughs> who was the Cosby? The Cosby, the um, one of the Cosbys who turned out to be the one who shot Jr. I think. Oh, Crosby. Crosby, yeah, see, yeah, yeah. Um, Denise Crosby. Denise. No, no, I don't think Denise so. Crosby. What was her name? But anyway, it was one. Of, she was. Um, she was in it. So, uh, but yeah, I haven't seen any of those. I haven't watched any of the new Dallas. So, um, but yes, well, Brett, thank you for phoning in. And it's turned into a mammoth show. Yes. yes. Must be. <laughs> we were yes. worried. 
we were well, worried we'd we wouldn't have enough to talk about. about but god knows we can talk and talk and talk so yeah. um yes. but i would yeah well thank you eric for choosing that and i'm sorry that so susie was triumphant over toy she's not triumphant this minute, you know, I mean, it, it, it's getting, it gets a bit embarrassing after a while, doesn't it? This sure. happens so often. But, Eric, did you have anything you wanted to say before we... Because we're going to... Yeah, hang on. Are you going to sing us out? Oh, here we go. Ooh, <gasps> I threw an 11. That means Susie is brilliant. And the only yeah. way to defeat the mystical orcs of Wibble Woo Woo is to play yeah. the theme song to Skullduggery. Oh, really? Ooh, okay. okay. Yeah. Well, should we, are you going to sing along? Um, yeah, but it'll, it'll be all out of time again. Okay, well let's pl- let's play it, and um, you can sing along. Before if you, you want, do so. that, I should probably announce yeah. what's next. Oh yes, oh, yes. yes uh, it's it's the, probably the polar opposite of Day of Judgment. Yeah. Yes, <laughs> I thought it was time to take us into the '90s, so we're going to cover Wes Craven's Scream next time. Yes, it should be interesting. We're also going to cover. Um, do we're going to be talking about? Um, we've all of us, or not all of us yet, but we will have all seen by that time a special screener of the upcoming Bloody Homecoming, um, uh, who, which was written by friends of the show, um, Jake Kelgren, and who we interviewed on an earlier podcast. So you go back and listen to that. Um, so we'll be covering that next time as well, along with Scream. So, um, yes, and say? also, um, if you haven't read it on the Facebook, we will be doing uh, DVD commentaries for one of the greatest slasher movies ever made, Savage Water. Yes. Right. Mm. That's not a lie. We really are doing the DVD commentary for Savage Water. But it is a lie that it's one of the greatest slasher movies ever made, isn't it? Yes. Uh, no, I'm, I'm telling the truth. Okay. Mm. Right. Well, t- t- time will tell. But yes. So if we could get through Day of Judgment and Skullduggery, we can get through that with ease. So yeah. we are playing out with this and we'll see you next time. Yes. Yeah, so and don't forget to all sing along to defeat the mystical orcs. Indeed. Sound a bit like hair. It does. It sounds like a musical. What's in my mind? Skulldogery! Skulldogery! Tearing on my mind! I mean, Eric, you sound a little off key this episode. You really do need to eat something. I think I do. I don't know the lyrics for the lyrics. Skulldogery! What's in my mind? Chunky Kit Kat. You got Toya there with you, Eric. You wish. He made another Toya crack. I can see what's in your hair. Can you? That's what it sounds like she said. Eric, I'm a little upset that we didn't sing along to the Fatal Frames episode. Mm. Yeah. We could do that for the Christmas show, couldn't we, as a special treat? That would be a treat. How long is this god awfulness? <laughs> it's brilliant. Oh, it's over. <laughs> <laughs> well goodbye everyone thanks for bye. listening goodbye. Bye. bye can you see what's in my mind yes it's called Augury. Kit Kats yeah <laughs> you got one. well yeah Kit Kats and Bob, Bob Hoskins. Hoskins holding Kit Kats yeah